I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, October 23rd, 2018. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Michael Perry from Ridgely Middle School. Uh, I then invite you to remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of Natasha Newman, a uh, Sandalwood Elementary student who died last week. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is to consider the agenda. Are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Mrs. White? Mr. Chair, first, let me say happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And, yeah, <laughs> and yes, I am. Yeah, and yes, I am recommending that the agenda be amended to remove item F3. So that requires unanimous approval of the board. Is there a um, uh, motion to remove F3? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor, please raise your hand. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair. Mrs. Miller. Uh, I move to uh, add an agenda item to discuss the modified motion to protect system records from destruction. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is something that we've been asking for uh, for, uh, I guess, going on s uh, six weeks now since the modification was made. It's an urgent matter, and we have not gotten answers to many of our questions. I believe that the motion um, does not have the effect that the, that the board intended, and it's something that we really need to discuss and address. I believe that it is an open session item. All right, there's a motion to amend the agenda to add the modified record retention uh, matter. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, the motion fails for lack of a majority. All right, earlier this evening, Mrs. Hen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to add the agenda item to discuss transportation concerns. Is there a second? In the community. Is there second. a second? Discussion? We've now, this is the third meeting, we've requested that transportation be added to the agenda so that staff can respond to board member concerns that we've heard from our communities regarding busing, particularly students standing in aisles, overcrowded buses, um, safety matters. Again, this is an urgent matter before the board. We continue to kick the can down the road and we need to address it. All right, the motion is to amend the agenda to include transportation concerns. All in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. The motion fails for lack of a majority. All right, early this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss, one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and seven, uh, uh, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found at our website at www.bcps.org backslash board backslash informational dash summaries dot html. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to this meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Um, board practice limits to 10. Uh, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right. Ms. Adekoy is going to draw those first ten names and Mr. Storch is going to read them. Our first and only name, uh, very special here, Dr. Bacheron. That's it. Okay. Uh, our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens as appropriate. We will refer your concerns to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this system, 
This is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. I ask that you observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. I'll now call on our advisory groups to speak first, and our first speaker, our first speaker is Tabco's representative, Abby Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. Behind me, you see some teachers from General John Stricker Middle School. They came to speak to you tonight, but did not understand that they needed to sign up by 625, and so they did not make it into your speaker list. So I promised that I would give them the, inf the information for them. And uh, it has to do with, in regard to the input to the new appointment of a principal for General John Stricker Middle. And they have listed six specific uh, principles that should embody what the characteristics of their principal should be. They are concerned about um, how the process is moving forward. And due to a large number of untenured teachers, a poll was conducted to support the claims of this petition. And there is a petition that I will give you with the numbers and the questions and the results below. So if anyone wants to talk to them after, obviously they will be available. We all understand that technology is with us throughout our lives, whether we are at the grocery store or a craft show buying something using a smartphone with a swipe attachment. It is all around us. It has speeded up our lives and made some things easier. That said, when it does not work properly, things can come to a screeching halt, or worse, incorrect information or a hacked system can make it impossible to form anything requiring those technologies. When that happens in the schoolhouse, it means teaching and learning can also come to a screeching halt. If, if it happens rarely, teachers can pull a great lesson out of their bag of tricks and continue with their students. When it becomes more frequent, a more frequent problem, especially if the text, information, worksheets, et cetera, are online, it becomes a nightmare for teachers and students because they cannot move forward with their lessons. Since we know the technology is going to crash at some time, we need to have the backup materials in place before that happens. We need curriculum basics in a form that doesn't always rely on computers. There should be some way that teachers have other methods of accessing these, those basic materials. We understand that most of the curricula need to be online, but for those times when our technology is not available, basic forms and guides need to be in the schoolhouse offline. A system should be in place so staff know what to do to access what is needed to continue the program in these events. Finally, we have also been dealing with environmental issues in some of our schools due to the wet weather we have been experiencing over the last year. We have requested HEPA air purifiers and dehumidifiers be placed in those rooms and buildings where the issues have become apparent. We have been working with facilities to identify these areas and to address them as they are happening. And we do appreciate the willingness of BCPS officials to work with this uh, on these issues. So thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Megan Stewart Sicking. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board, good evening to all of you. Supporting staffing increases during budget planning is a major priority for CCAC, and we want to highlight our gratitude for the teachers, transition facilitators, and board-certified behavior analysts we received last year. Special education remains an area of great need due to student numbers and complex needs that continue to increase annually. One priority we want to emphasize early this year is the need to increase paraeducators. Despite requests in the past three budget cycles, there have not been increases in paraeducator positions. Paraeducators are critical staff who support the provision of services under the guidance of special education teachers. As we know well, teacher caseloads are too large and it is difficult to accomplish everything for every type of learner in every type of classroom. 
We receive feedback from teachers and administrators alike regarding the importance of paraeducators. They comment that the support they provide allows teachers to be able to customize instruction to meet the varying needs of their students. With additional paraeducators in schools, teachers would be able to more effectively use targeted small group instruction. Additional paraeducators would also provide opportunities for students to be supported in more content areas. For example, students may currently have support in ELA and math, but may not have support in science, social studies, or other subjects. Students may not always receive the support they need, and teachers are even more stretched to meet goals due to a lack of support staff. We simply cannot continue to ignore the importance of paraeducators when we talk about classroom support. We urge you to make sure that paraeducator requests are not cut in this budget process. We also support continued increases in special education teachers, speaking tonight specifically about elementary schools. Students in their home schools benefit from being with typical peers and a regular length bus ride to the neighborhood schools. But this means special educators must support classroom teachers and offer small group or individual instruction. Last year, some of the approved allocations were able to provide this continuum of services, but every school must have adequate staffing to ensure students have both inclusion opportunities and access to specialized instruction outside the general education classroom. And finally, as I shared with you at our last meeting, we continue to work on our initiative for a collaborative and civil IEP team process. I want to thank elementary IEP chairs and special educators for sharing their thoughts with us today and the secondary group which will meet on Thursday this week. We look forward to more feedback from stakeholders and to crafting a united message this year. Wonderfully timed. Our next speaker is the PTA Council of Baltimore County Representative and I'm a good handwriting reader, Leslie Weber. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Board of Education members, and Ms. White. I'm Leslie Weber, Secretary of the PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Jane Lee. We were happy to meet Community Superintendent Christina Byers at our October board meeting. We're grateful that Sue Hahn and Ch Charlie Herndon from the Office of Family and Community Engagement also attend our meetings. These relationships improve communication and cooperation. We recently held our fall reception and workshops where PTA leaders learned how to run their units better and increase outreach through improved communications and service, service to students in need. Dr. Laurie Taylor Mitchell, president of the Student Support Network, shared ideas for creating food and necessities pantries, as has been done through the network at Lock Raven and Parkville High Schools and Pine Grove Middle. The agenda for tonight's meeting includes a presentation on year four of STAT implementation, and it's a very mixed report. We've testified many times about STAT's massive costs and its opportunity costs in a system with so many pressing and competing needs. When nearly half of BCPS students live in poverty and many schools need to be replaced or renovated, we must question this investment, especially when the Hopkins report states that STAT's measurable impacts on student park or map achievement are not yet clear. Most frequently, principals indicated that they had either not seen a specific change in their students' achievement, or if they had, they were not sure that STAT was a driving factor. MAP grade three winter reading scores showed that only 56.4 of grade three students dem demonstrated on grade performance. MAP grade three ELA scores have declined over time in eight out of 10 lighthouse schools. We agree with report recommendations that strategies be implemented to address off-task behaviors while using devices and cell phones. We've testified at past meetings for the need for a system-wide cell phone policy. It was suggested in the past that device use, in addition to closing the achievement gap, would improve student behavior, but this has not happened. As noted in the report, office referral rates have increased and suspension rates have increased for three out of four cohorts from pre-program years. The cost of STAT very soon will reach a half billion dollars. Parents have not been asking for more tech. They've been demanding safer schools, improved transportation, and new school construction or renovations to address overcrowding and substandard conditions. Everyone must think carefully about how precious tax dollars are, are being spent. These funds could be used to decrease class sizes, improve teacher pay, hire more teachers, guidance counselors, social workers, pupil personnel, 
pupil personnel workers, paraeducators, behavior interventionists, and other support staff, and offer wraparound services, all things proven to enhance educational outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, Julie miller bretz Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. Later tonight, we'll be hearing an evaluation report on year four of the STAT program. I recognize, as I know all you do, how important the evaluation process is, particularly when new initiatives are put into place. Everyone connected to the district wants to know, is this new initiative working? What data do we have to support these conclusions? Is this something we need to continue or discontinue or tweak in some way? But all of these same questions can also be asked of another initiative that started five years ago in the 2013-14 school year. This was the year that the Advanced Academics Initiative began in elementary ELA classes. In this model, GT students were no longer necessarily placed into standalone GT classrooms, but were part of heterogeneous classrooms with students of mixed abilities. In this new model, students can flow in and out of different tiers, the scaffolded tier, the enrichment tier, or the accelerated tier based on unit assessments that are occurring in the classroom. This allows students to flexibly access advanced material instead of being tracked into a rigid or uh, rigid GT or non-GT pathway that could then potentially follow a student throughout their school career. Teachers are now expected to teach to all levels by breaking students into groups and differentiating instruction for each of these tiers. The Baltimore Sun at the time these changes were happening reported that parents were confused about the new gifted program and that school leaders never announced the change. There was a lot of concern among parents about how this new approach would work and whether teachers would be prepared to support the multiple groups of students working with different books and different curricula. What has changed in these five years? Essentially nothing. We are very aware that many parents still do not know how the advanced academics program is supposed to work. In fact, at our October GTCAC meeting where we hosted school board candidates, it was apparent that the candidates were not completely clear about how advanced academics is supposed to work. Parents frequently tell us that they don't know where their child has been placed or know what options exist. They remain concerned about the level of instruction provided to the accelerated tier of students, and we have heard multiple times about accelerated children placed on a device instead of having dedicated time with their classroom teacher. We hear that they are not receiving the challenge they need. There is a lot we still don't know about advanced academics. What evaluation and accountability and data collection happens around this program? How are the program philosophy, policies, and procedures communicated to schools and to parents, since we hear of very disparate approaches among schools in the district? How is student participation in the AGT program, annual yearly growth, or program failures or successes tracked? Has it changed advanced academics positively or negatively affected GT students? Is there an assessment tool? What is the new model being measured against? And circling back to STAT, how is this program impacting GT students? It is time for BCPS to start reporting and disseminating information about the effectiveness of the advanced academic program. Finally, please join us on November 7th at 7 p.m. here at Greenwood for our next GTCAC meeting where, we'll be, where we will be hosting Interim Superintendent for Lita White. We know it will be a great meeting. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is from the Northeast Area Advisory Council, Lily Lee. Dear BOE members, I'm Lily Lee again, Northeast Advisory Council. I'm here to urge BCPS to provide the bus drivers with correct tools, but not a better tool like a route finder. A lot of times when we, have, when we heard that kids were dropped off in the middle of the major road, or that kids were dropped at the wrong stop, we blame the bus driver. What did he or she do? Why she or he didn't care for our children's safety? Well, not until very recently did I get to know that most of times it was not the bus driver's fault. It was a problem with the sheets that the bus drivers were provided to work with from the bad tool, Route Finder. Now let's listen to F's senior president, Michael Fahey. He will have all the information from the front line. Thank you. Yeah, Route Finder is the system used to route uh buses for Baltimore County Public Schools. The system replaced the manual system used prior to this implementation. There are roughly three routing assistants at each bus lot, total of 11 bus lots. 
There's a few routing assistance at Pulaski Park, but I don't know how many because it's not part of our bargaining unit. Routing assistants at the bus lots are no longer allowed to make changes to the route sheets without the approval from Pulaski Park. Buses are routed to unsafe streets, unsafe turns, required to turn around in restricted areas. The times allowed are woefully inadequate. There is pressure to get to the next stop, our schools, to meet timelines. Speeding will happen as a consequence of this pressure. This will get worse as we move to winter and darkness. Bus lot routing assistants are familiar with roads in their areas, but Pulaski Park routing assistants are only familiar with their computers. Consequently, routes generated at Pulaski do not take into account real-world situations. Drivers have safety concerns, but those concerns are not being addressed. Bus lot routing assistants are being used as bus drivers for six hours each day and don't have the time or energy to do what, we, what they were intended to do. There is a closed door policy at bus lots. If you want to see a manager or a routing assistant, they are not available and you are asked to make an appointment. Never used to be like this. More management and more doors that are closed. Drivers daily have to cover routes that are, they are not familiar with. We are given a route sheet, but this is inaccurate and alarming number of times. Make a wrong turn, it's not easy to turn around in a school bus and easy to get lost. This is extremely stressful for any driver and makes you want to quit. We have many concerns, we have other concerns. We want to, f when we find a child who doesn't belong on that bus has been put on the school bus and you have to take them back. Also, some children don't belong. You, they stop and get out there to meet them. I've had to return a child seven times since the beginning of the school year. Thank you, Mr. Fay. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Dr. Ferron. Good evening to all. The Board of Education has not articulated a secular reason for closing the schools on the Jewish holidays and not doing the same for the Muslim holidays. If it is true that there is a large number of Jewish teachers and other employees in the school system, then that raises the question, why not really even a small number of employees came here and requested the closure on the Jewish holidays? It really raises another question. Why the school employees are two colors and two religions only? This Baltimore County is diverse. You see it in every day, every business, everywhere. And I really don't see that in the employees. So as you know, we are a nation of immigrants. We just came at different times. And many of us came because of religious persecution. Many of us, like me, came for equality and equity. And closing the schools on the Jewish holidays for the past 25 years is clearly a mistake, was clearly a mistake. And the way to solve that, in my opinion, as I told you before, is to close on the Muslim holidays equal to the Jewish holidays. However, I would really ask you to consider, as I did by my email, to bar the use of absenteeism as an indicator of one's religion. An employee who doesn't show up on any day could be sick, could be sleepy, could be tired, could be having a cramp, could be maybe religious, maybe not, just wants the day off. That's a poor indicator. It has been used before, and it should not be used any time after today. I also remind you with Ms. Ann Miller, board member Ann Miller motion two years ago. She requested the board to return the issue of the holidays to the PRC and has not really, to my knowledge, been discussed there. I really ask you, Mr. Versch, to consider that. I'd be glad to help you in that. I promise not to be uh, talking too much, uh, anything like that. And. Um, um, I really appreciate that you are putting up with me for all the years. Thank you very much. Can I speak more or? Yeah. 
You have That's 19 it? seconds. That's it? Yeah. S no s more? 15. All right. Thank you. 12. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Frohn. Uh, next on our agenda is item F, personnel matters. I invite Ms. Lowry to come forward. <coughs> Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service. Is there a motion to accept F1, 2, and 4? So moved. All right. Um, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. That's unanimous. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item G, um, administrative appointments. And for that, I invite Mrs. White to make presentation. <laughs> Chairman uh, Gillis and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal, Newtown Elementary School. Executive Director, Social and Emotional Support, Division of School Climate and Safety. Coordinator, Office of Mathematics, Pre-K through 12. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments presented in Exhibit G? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. It is again unanimous. Back to you, Mrs. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we'd like to recognize and congratulate the following appointments and the following individuals. When you hear your name, please stand so that we can celebrate you and you may stand with your family as well so that we can celebrate your family. So uh, first on uh, the docket, we have Christopher Baker, who will be the new assistant principal in Newtown Elementary School. <laughs> Christopher, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Congratulations. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Natalie Christ, who will be the new coordinator of Office of Mathematics, Pre-K through 12. Hi, Natalie. Do you have anyone here with you tonight? Very good. Congratulations. And although he is not in attendance tonight, we'd like to recognize Dr. Amalio Nieves, who will be the new Executive Director of Social Emotional Support in the Division of School Climate and Safety. Mr. Chair, that's my report. Thank you very much. Next on our agenda is consideration of actions taken in closed session, and for that I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Thank you, good evening. Uh, earlier this evening, the board considered three appeals regarding confidential student matters in all three were considered on the record as there were no requests for oral argument. Uh, at this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in that closed session in those matters, which were summary affirmance numbers 1843, 1912, and 1917. Let's do them one at a time. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on matter 1843? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And abstention or recuse? Two, Mr. M Mr. Virch and Mrs. Miller. That carries. Next, do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on matter 1912? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And again, recuse and abstain. Birch and Miller. And the last matter, a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on 19 17. So moved. And a second? Second. Discussion. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And one abstention. Thank Mrs. You. Miller. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item I, contract awards, and for that I invite Mr. Stewart to take over. Thank you, yes. 
Earlier this evening, the Building and Contracts Committee met to consider items uh, I-1 through I-8. Uh, the board was unanimous in its recommendations, um, oh, I'm sorry, the committee was unanimous in its recommendations to the board uh, for the approval of items I-1 through I-8 with the acknowledgement that items I-1 through I-3 are warranting additional discussion. For that happen, we invite Mr. Sayers to come forward. While he's coming forward, is it uh, appropriate uh, for a uh, vote on m matters I-4 through I-8? So moved. All right, there's no need for a second. All in favor of approving I-4 to I-8, please raise your hands. It is unanimous. And would you please reflect, Ms. Stifler, that I've recused myself from number six, materials contract. And then let's go to matter one. Mr. Saris. Uh, this is a new cooperative contract for access to ProQuest online database and digital content for all schools. Approval is requested for a seven month contract with the option for four one year extensions with one recommended bidder and contract spending authority of $330,000. Is there a motion to approve I-1? So moved. Discussion. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening. And I was just um, curious, we just passed a contract at the last meeting related to a um, company that's <clears throat> uh, online uh, for open access uh, resources, but it compiles them and vets them and sorts them for our staff, teachers, and so forth to have access. So it seems to me that this is yet another software um, that is providing similar if not exactly the same content to our students. We also have a great deal of other things in terms of databases, online databases. So I'm curious, what is distinctive about this? Um, or is it going to replace one of those other things that we're paying for? I mean, we're... So I think Mr. Imbriali can best explain that uh, for you. <coughs> Welcome, Mr. Imbriali. I Good evening. Uh, Mrs. Causey, this is a, a product, um, ProQuest has three pieces to it. It has SIRS, which is a statewide database that all of our public libraries use and all of the public school systems, all 24 in the state of Maryland. And uh, that's for journal referenced articles. So those journal collections are journals that you typically have to pay for per, for individual subscriptions. This is a collection of all of those resources. It covers everything from you know, his, history, um, science, mathematics, so they're journaling articles is essentially what's coming out of there. The other piece that's part of that is culturegrams, so it's a collection of information on 200 various countries, um, all sorts of information in, in, including um, uh, articles about the country, uh, videos about the country, um, <coughs> references to various resources about the individual countries. And then the third part is ProQuest Education, uh, which is a collection of uh, around 20,000 dissertations um, and vetted articles that our professionals in the school system have access to. Uh, again, those would be resources that they'd have to pay for if they didn't have access this way. And how have we been utilizing SIRS in the past? Or uh, we have not. We have. We've had the product since 2005. And how have we been procuring it since then? Uh, through this uh, statewide consortium, uh, previously there were five different resources uh, under a single contract. We've, uh, we're now only purchasing two of those, and we have brought them to you at the last meeting and at this meeting. Those are the two remaining items that we're purchasing through this uh, cooperative network. Okay, but it does not say that it's replacing a contract that's going to expire. It doesn't say it's replacing. Yeah, we've decided not to replace the previous contract. So uh, rather than because it was a bundled collection of five different products. So we brought two products to you, one the last meeting and one this meeting as separate items. So you're saying previously we had one contract where we were bundling five of these online resources? Five different products. I don't know if they were all online. It, uh, it was the, it, it, the contract was the, I, I don't know the official title, but it was the MDK-12 consortium. 
So the consortium is how we purchase these products. That's um, the fiscal agent for that consortium is the Montgomery County Public Schools. The State Department's part of it and all the 24 LEAs. So since I believe 2005, because that's when this process began, I was not in this role at that time, uh, it was as the MDK-12 consortium is how the contract would have looked to this board. We've separated out each of the individual products and have said it's being bought through the consortium. And so how does the total dollar value relate to what we were spending in the past versus what we're spending now? So the consortium negotiates the prices, so all 24 LEAs come together to negotiate the, the price, and that price is then what the Montgomery County Public Schools publishes for each of the various products that are part of the consortium. Uh, the cost of this product actually was more expensive in 2005, um, and then it's fluctuated slightly, but it's approximately $60,000 a year. Okay, but is that, is, that a, is that a dollar value that's going down for these five, or is it a cost that's going up? The, the f these two five. items. Uh, so just to be are, clear, they yeah. don't have five bundled together anymore. They only have one that's before us, okay? Right, but we've already passed a contract to pay for some of the other ones, and then they're saying there's another contract that's coming forward. Well, we had one last week. And then the other three, you're not coming forward with? Correct. Okay. Uh, just, to, just to clarify, one of the products is World Book. World Book is less than $25,000 a year to purchase that product. Okay. It's the, it's the encyclopedia for our libraries. Mm -hmm. So that's in here, or that's the next, the last that, piece of the puzzle? That won't that's come, that, that that won't won't come, won't come the because board. it's less than $25,000. Okay. But, so my question is, are we in fact spending more per year on these resources now than we were previously to have the same level of content for our students. No, they're, so, so to, to be clear, that we're just bringing them as separate products. The price, depending on the product, is based on various things, number of buildings or enrollment. So that can always fluctuate, but that's outlined through the MDK-12 consortium and the purchasing office in Montgomery County. But just to also be clear, I heard Mr. Embriali already say that the five-year-ago price for this component uh, was more than it is now. That's correct. In 2005, 2005 the, the, the price has come down since 2005, and then has fluctuated over that time. Well, fluctuating means up and down. So is it down or is it up and down? I, in, <laughs> in last year, we paid $62,936. The year prior to that, we paid the exact same price. Okay, I'm not sure that that uh, completely answers my question. The other one is the M MDK212 consortium. Um, are these products on the MSDE approved list? because you're saying that they were a part of this consortium? The consortium's run by the State Department of Education. Okay. Yeah. That answers that. Thank you. Any further questions, Mr. Virch? Hi, directing your attention to the uh, contract analysis that uh, the recommendation form that was provided. Um, under one of the items it reads, number of vendors requesting solicitation uh, was 38, and then it says number of bids received was 38. That process was not done by us. That was done by the Montgomery County Public Schools. Who On behalf of the state of Maryland, yes. So they put out 38, and they got 38 bids back. And from then, and, and through that, working with the consortium, they selected this particular vendor. This is one of the 38. Right, okay. Correct. Very good. Thank you. Further questions? Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Uh, the term is so Microphone. The term is seven months with a four-year extension. Is that, that's an automatic extension. It won't come back before the board after seven months. Is that correct? The way Montgomery County uh, manages their process is that they will go back to their board each year, and we will be notified. Uh, we're asking for a four-year, seven-month uh, administrative authority to renew subject to Montgomery County's renewal they will notify us each year and if they notify us that for some reason an item this item is being removed they will we will uh, try to obtain an alternative product or the same product from another contract we actually brought an example of that to this board brain pop 
So Brain Pop was a part of the consortium for a number of years, and then it was removed out of the consortium. Um, and it did, did the board get a copy of the contract to review? No. Uh, and it says that we're, uh, I guess we're piggybacking off of Montgomery County, Montgomery County's contract. This is a cooperative contract with all 24 the state MSDE has identified Montgomery as the lead agency for the purpose of administering and advertising and awarding contracts. Okay, so when we piggyback, and I, I, you just have to explain this to me, do we then have our own contract separate from that? Yes. Okay. And so did the board get, um, was, were we able to review the Montgomery County contract? It's online, okay. yes. So and I mean, we review it as part of our attached? due diligence uh, efforts. Anytime we, in this case, this is truly a cooperative administration of programs. You can see cited the state education article. Uh, in other cases, where we are, so this is a cooperative contract. A piggyback contract or a contract that we are riding from another agency is somewhat different because we are not a member of that consortium, but we are uh, in, ensuring that public procurement practices were followed by that entity. We are documenting it and then we are making a recommendation to the board to adopt those terms for itself. So we're, we're adopting identical terms? Yes, in this case. Okay, all right, good, thank you. All right, all in favor of contract I-1, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, it's unanimous. The next contract is I-2, 403B Financial Consulting Services. Is there a motion to accept that contract? All right, discussion. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you could just explain a little bit about the uh, plan. You, it says in the description of our contract summary that the plan assets of $453 million are administered by the Department of Human Resources and the plans investment committee comprised of representatives from each of the employee bargaining units. Um, can you just explain a little bit more about that? Because what you're talking about doing is moving it in, in addition to increasing the contract value um, from 150,000 to 225,000. You're also talking about the board authorizing moving the um, responsibility for this from the school office of, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Department of Fiscal Services to the Department of Human Resources Operations. So if you could just explain a little bit about that and why the move. Uh, the plan, when the plan was originally set up, uh, Fiscal Services took the lead uh, on the project, but for practical purposes, for about the past five years, Human Resources has been managing the program, or administering the program, because it is, in fact, a, an employee benefit, and that is a function of Human Resources. And we have the chair of the invest investment committee is the uh, employee benefits manager, I am also still a member of the investment committee along with all the employee bargaining groups. So when you're talking about the investment committee and having the assets, at, at, are those assets in play all the time or they are being paid out and then it shrinks down, the balance shrinks down? How is that working and, and um, you know, how does that actually work? How does that function well, with, uh, that, with that amount and who's managing it? Well, it's managed by five different investment management companies and, and our consultant, CBiz, uh, evaluates their performance on a uh, quarterly basis and meets with us twice a year to present reports and advise us uh, on their performance and whether to retain uh, 
that particular uh, mutual fund or uh, investment manager. Uh, funds are being, uh, contributions are being made bi-weekly by participating employees. Uh, an, a significant amount of this total balance of $453 million has been rolled over from other uh, retirement accounts into ours, so probably about half of the total contribute, half of the total assets were contributed through BCPS, and another half was rolled over into our plan. And yes, as people retire and begin to withdraw funds, there's uh, an outflow of assets. Okay, so it, it does appear too that there's, uh, are you increasing the time frame of this contract? No. CBIS? This is the original 10 year term. Okay, so the end date is remaining at June 30th, 2021. Yes. Now, because it's with a financial services company, is that a contract that can be um, reconsidered by the board or is, along well, the lines of some of our commodities and other services, or is it, are we more restricted to? No, I think it's subject to the same terms, but you know, any contract can be terminated for cause or convenience, but um, in this case, we would want to ensure that there's, there's a continuity of coverage, and so we would not want to do that arbitrarily or without due consideration. Okay, thank you. Further questions about contract I-2, Mr. Stewart? This is just a quick one, but how market is it for a fund this size to have five investment managers? Um, it is typical, uh, historically typical. Um, it is uh, becoming more uh, commonplace to re limit the number of investment managers to reduce fees. Right. And uh, that is something that the committee is taking into consideration. Um, and are there certain specialties with the individual managers? Like one might be focused on debt investments, one's restructuring investments, one might be equities. These, these would likely be growth and value and typical investment uh, kind of columns. So there's a money manager or a financial advisor that handles growth stocks. There's one that handles well, necessarily, not necessarily. Normally, I'm, I'm sure the fund has an investment plan. Yes. Correct? Yes. And in the investment plan, it will identify uh, the parameters of what your investments are in and the allocation of your investments. And when you're using multiple managers, it, more, one or more managers can actually have large cap funds. But what you're looking at is make sure that the total of all large cap funds falls mm -hmm. within the allocation that the investment committee decides. And they get that information in terms of what's going on in the marketplace from this company that's advising them. This company is not telling them buy this, buy that, but this company is advising them. Sometimes you want to change the balance of your portfolio, you, you want to move it around, or if investment managers don't meet their goals, you may make changes uh, as you are advised to do. Right. Okay. Uh, similar to a company that um, uh, sort of analyzes the investment managers. I'm trying to ask questions about, I guess, the value of having five managers and whether it's because they have different specialties or areas of focus or whether they're collaborative in such a way that's unique or whether this is just Each one of, of them. them offers a, an array of mutual funds that represent all the asset classes, and it's up to the individual employee to sit down with the advisor from one of the five groups to develop their own strategy and risk allocations. All right, all in favor of contract I-2, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, that's unanimous. And the last contract we have is uh, contract I-3, a modification of a milk, dairy, and fruit juice contract. 
Is there a motion to accept that contract? I'll move. Now, discussion. So I am all in favor of our children getting food that will give them the calcium they need to grow their bones. And I am just curious about the uh, modification amount for this contract. Uh, so it's a relatively small amount. The contract uh, ends at the end of the current fiscal year, and we will have a new contract in place uh, ahead of that time. And uh, the additional spending authority is intended to ensure that we get through this fiscal year and this contract um, with adequate re uh, spending authority because uh, so many of our programs have been expanded recently, and um, we wanted to make sure that the increased participation was supported uh, with appropriate spending. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's wonderful. Mr. Virch. Is Mr. Padillo around? I believe so. Yes, he's yeah. Good evening, good, good evening, evening, Mr. Patello. Thank you for, for being here this evening. And we do have this contract. And I see that over the course of, I want to say, since 2011, perhaps uh, maybe $20 million has, has gone to buy food to be <coughs> distributed to our kids. And what I wanted to ask you about is uh, currently, um, when children you know, go through the, the lunch line in the cafeteria, uh, it's, a, it's obviously a different um, process than uh, some of us older members, uh, we would reach into our pocket as a student and take out the two cents for the, the little little milk and kind of go on our way. Um, but when I was over at um, uh, Honeygo, I uh, for the ribbon cutting, I went into the cafeteria because I like to go back and talk to the folks that you know like are making these things happen for kids. And I talked with the manager and I asked about when kids come through this line, you know, are they still like reaching into their pocket and pulling out a couple of pennies and like that? And she said, No, that's not how it's done. And if you could just take a brief moment to share with board members just how, just, just how kids go through that line and, and pay for uh, or somehow uh, are able then to receive food. Sure. Again, as a kid goes through a line and they get their fruit, their vegetable, their milk, their grain, their meat, they go to the cashier. Each cashier has a pen pad. It's probably maybe about the size of that and each child is assigned a pin. So again, it's just a random four digit number. There's no type of, of identifier with the number. So if I'm a free kid, you wouldn't know my number from whether I'm a paid kid or reduced kid. So again, everybody's randomly assigned a four digit number. They punch it in, they go on their way. That's very much how it was explained to me by the cafeteria manager over at, at Honeygo or whatever the, the appropriate title is. Um, I remember talking with um, uh, some folks in, in uh, the office that administers um, much of this, and they explained how in some schools that, you know, the kids are sent home with like templates so that at home they can practice doing like a keypad sort of a thing. Um, I did want to ask you, uh, let's say a child comes to school and uh, they, uh, you know, on their pin, there isn't any, you know, there isn't anything there to be debited to. What happens, uh, or what's, what then, then, then occurs? So the system's policy is in K through eight. Uh, they are extended two days worth of credit. Again, after that, then the children are given an alternative meal. Okay, and if you could just take just a moment and explain what, what do you mean by an alternative meal? Uh, in our particular school system, it is a, a cheese sandwich, a dairy product, which is usually milk, and then a fruit. Gotcha. And a cheese sandwich, a uh, dairy product, uh, or rather a milk and a, and a fruit, those are items that are available on the line for anybody going through the line to, to pick up and, and select for themselves. Is that right? Absolutely. Those products are available to any student who goes through the line. So. Okay. Now, we have some kids that are going through the line that are like first graders. And that can be a bit of a challenge for a first grader to know what, what they can do and what they can pick and what they can't pick if, in fact, there isn't anything on there, uh, you know, left on their pin to be debited. How would that be handled at school so that the kids, uh, the amount of, you know, uh, credit on their uh, um, pin number isn't like common knowledge for other kids? Well, we sent a communication to the parents. So, for example, if I had a, a young child and they had uh, extended, passed the extended credit, then the parent would actually be contacted and let them know. That again, your kid has exhausted their balance, and again, we try to work with the the parents. 
I got you. Now let me ask you about like the breakfast program in our schools. Um, just, just how successful has this breakfast program been? I, it, it's done very well. I know uh, we're just finalizing our numbers for September, but again, for breakfast, we had about 65,000 that uh, got breakfast at no charge. So we also had some additional schools this year. We got 14 additional schools through the breakfast in the classroom program. So that's helped us a lot. Usually on an average year, we get three to seven schools. So again, to be able to get that funding for the state to do 14 schools, that was fantastic for the school system. And if I might ask you, with regard to like the breakfast program and, you know, that, that starts at a certain time in the morning at the school and it runs for a certain period of time, but let's say in between there, uh, school has started and the kid and one of our kids, one of our students arrives late to the school. How, how is that handled in some of our schools? We do have s some schools that have uh, breakfast after the bell, but again, we work with, with certain schools for that. Some principals do have that program in their schools and some don't, so kind of depends on the school for that. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Bedell. Thank you, George. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? All in favor of contract I-3, please raise your hand. It, too, is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Thank you, Mr. Petillo. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item J, a report on STAT. Dr. Brown, you come forward. I believe that Dr. Morrison and Dr. Ross are going to come forward as well. Yes. And Mr. Chair, as Dr. Brown is coming forward, I was just going to say that in keeping with our commitment to provide the board with an external evaluation of the STAT initiative. Doctors Ross and Morrison are here uh, once again to provide their recommendations. As they're getting set up, I want to take a moment to remind the board that in keeping with our past practice, uh, the board will receive the evaluation tonight, just as we have recently received the evaluation, and the curriculum committee will receive the school system's responses to those recommendations at an upcoming meeting. So with that, I'll turn it over to Drs. Ross and Morrison. Dr. Unless Brown Dr. already Brown, disappeared. Dr. Brown, you wanted to, to <laughs> chime in there. All that stuff she said. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, it's nice to be here. Feels like it's been a little while, but I don't think it has. Um, so let's see. So displayed on your screen is the evaluation model that includes the time frames for when one might expect to see results. As we've discussed before, in year one and beyond, we'll expect to see the impact of professional development on the classroom environment, teacher practice, and access and use of digital content. Also in year one and beyond, we expect to see the impact on student engagement. And the impact on 21st century skills will likely be evident in year two and beyond. The effect on goals, including student achievement, will be evident in years three to four and beyond. So our data sources for the evaluation included both quantitative and qualitative measures. We conducted interviews and focus groups with participants in both Lighthouse and Phase Two schools. The classroom teacher survey was administered to all teachers within Lighthouse and Phase Two grades participating in STAT. The survey was only administered to content area teachers, which means those involved in teaching language arts, math, science, social studies, or some combination of these subjects. Classroom observations in April in Lighthouse schools and phase two schools were conducted. So we um, mounted 186 classrooms observed for 20 minutes each, which meant that we had 3,720 minutes of observations. And then just a reminder of the instrument that we used, the inter-rater reliability was established in spring 2015, and you can have anywhere between zero and 1.0, and we resulted with an alpha of 0.972, which means very reliable. Then student behavioral data, including attendance, office referrals, and suspensions. And we also included in the presentation tonight, map assessment data for Lighthouse grades K through six and non-Lighthouse one through three. And then park data for grade three and Lighthouse four through six. And then the last point was parent and student responses to the stat-specific climate survey that BCPS developed and administered. Just, just as a reminder of STAT experience, since we just finished up the fourth year of STAT, grade groups within Lighthouse and Phase Two schools are in different years of experience with STAT implementation. So cohort one involves Lighthouse grades one through three that began in year one, which is 2014-15, and they're now in their fourth year of STAT, or just finished their fourth year of STAT. They're starting their fifth year. The year two cohort includes Lighthouse grades K4 and 5, phase two grades one through three, and Lighthouse grade six. This cohort just finished their third year of STAT. 
The year three cohort includes phase two grades K-4-5, phase two grade six, Lighthouse grade seven, and Lighthouse High School. So that cohort is in there, just finished their second year of SAT. And then the year four cohort includes Lighthouse grade six and phase two grade seven and eight. So that cohort began at the start of the last school year. So for a preview of year four results, research on school district technology integration initiatives have shown that there's a higher increase or a higher student engagement, an increase in student-centered instruction, and improved student achievement. What we found for fourth year results in BCPS was that there are changes from teacher to student-centered learning, shifts to teachers coaching rather than presenting content, deeper and more varied use of instructional technology, and a positive impact on student engagement. So based on the SAT logic model, professional development should lead to measurable outcomes and the achievement of BCPS goal. In order to assess the professional development, we conducted interviews, focus groups, and administered our teacher survey that solicited perceptions of professional development offered through the district and by the STAT teacher in each of the schools. So in terms of our survey, we asked questions about the helpfulness of the types of professional development that teachers received. As displayed on the screen, teachers expressed largely positive views regarding the PD they'd received. The majority of teachers across all four cohorts have agreed they've received sufficient PD on not only the use of technology in the classroom, but also the creation of learner-centered environments. The majority of teachers also agree that they're able to apply what they learned during PD sessions in their classrooms. In terms of recommendations that surfaced during focus groups, clarifying the stat teacher's specific role in the school was the most frequent offered. Additionally, the participant groups highlighted that teachers could benefit from being provided more time and structured opportunities to explore the technology programs available to them. In terms of the STAT teacher program, principals and teachers indicated often emphatically the importance and numerous contributions their STAT teachers make in their schools. They indicated that STAT teachers wear many hats, they work in a variety of capacities in schools and are viewed as highly accessible by teachers. In addition to leading professional development, roles include providing assistance with instructional planning, providing teachers with education technology resources, and then coaching and mentoring. Furthermore, though they serve as members of the school's leadership team, the stat teachers express that their position's non-evaluative status helps them mentor, coach, and provide encouragement to teachers in unique ways that help foster professional growth. Oh, no. Okay. In order to assess the impact on the classroom environment and teacher practice, classroom observations were conducted in Lighthouse and Phase Two schools, and the results of our April observations were conducted with baseline observations. Access to digital content was examined through participants' perceptions on technology integration through interviews, focus groups, and the teacher survey. And just as a reminder of the observation rating scales, we had a five-point scale that the instrument examined components specific to the classroom environment, teacher practice, student engagement, and 21st century skills. And then each, each item was rated to the extent it was observed during those 20 minutes that the observer was in the classroom. Overall, classroom observation results, like those that are displayed on the screen, were generally similar in spring 2018 with the baseline observations for each cohort. Classroom environments were generally similar across all four cohorts during the most recent observations. The items that varied the most between the cohorts dealt with students using different workspaces for different learning activities. And here we saw more frequency in cohort one and two and three and less in cohort four. And then in terms of the impact on teacher practice, with very few exceptions, observation findings in the spring of 2018 were mostly similar to the baseline observations for each cohort. Across the 10 teacher practice items on the OASIS 21, only 11 statistically significant findings were identified among the cohort subgroups. As with previous years, teachers were observed making frequent use of coaching and facilitating and occasional use of presenting Higher order instructional feedback and higher level questioning techniques were both observed infrequently during the classroom visits, while student initiated communication was exhibited comparatively more often. As with previous years, use of flexible grouping was rarely observed, if ever, in each of the cohorts. 
So overall, the results from interviews, surveys, and focus groups suggest that the STAT initiative is having a positive influence on teacher practice. Principals, STAT teachers, and classroom teachers express that there's been an increase in student-centered, differentiated, and individualized instruction that they believe is the result of STAT. Teachers also indicate that they've made changes in their practice by incorporating more varied instructional resources and instructional technology into their teaching this year. The findings from our online teacher survey stood in slight contrast to the observation results, and they're largely congruent with the findings from the interview focus groups. Classroom teachers across all four cohorts indicated that they make moderate or frequent use of a variety of teaching practices, including direct instruction, cooperative learning, project-based instruction, and independent work. And positive statistically significant changes were found for the survey responses for three subgroups. For example, phase two, grades one through three, teachers reported improving their skills at engaging students in collaborative learning. Lighthouse grades K4 and five, teachers reported increasing the frequency of direct instruction. And both Lighthouse K4-5 and Lighthouse Grade 7 teachers reported increasing the frequency they used individualized learning this year. And then the impact on digital content. Classroom teachers in the four cohorts indicated their use of BCPS1 through survey responses. In each of the cohorts, the most frequent use of BCPS1 was to deliver instruction customized to students' needs followed by using the platform to develop assignments, as teachers most often reported using the platform at least once a week for these purposes. Comparatively, the use of BCPS1 to develop formative assessments and post-homework assignments was reported less frequently by participants. And there were noticeable differences between the four cohorts. Cohorts one and two generally made daily use of the platform for delivering instruction. Cohorts three and four most often reported weekly use for this purpose. Cohort one teachers, the most experienced, uh, most often reported daily use of BCPS1 for developing assignments, while teachers from the other cohorts generally did this weekly. And then cohorts three and four reported using BCPS more frequently for posting homework assignments, whereas the majority of cohort one and two teachers reported never using the platform for this purpose. Results suggest that STAT's having a positive influence on the use of digital content and technology integration. Teachers reported making frequent use of BCPS1 to deliver instruction customized to students' needs and develop both assignments and formative assessments. Both principals and teachers express they feel integration of technology is deepening as a result of the initiative. Principals frequently highlighted that they've seen notable improvements with teachers' technology integration since the inception of the initiative, and many also expressed that they've seen an increase in teachers collaborating with one another each year. Teachers expressed similar sentiments. On the survey, the majority of teachers reported that technology is now a very strong part of both their <coughs> teaching practices and their instructional planning. Classroom teachers also reported the more varied use of technological resources and tools for instruction have been their greatest success with STAT this year. Many teachers, particularly those at the secondary level, also indicated that more extensive use of digital assessments was also a key success. Taken in combination, these results reinforce the findings presented in previous years that the initiative appears to be a beneficial force on teachers' use of digital content. We also examined the impact of professional development on the second category of measurable outcomes, student engagement and 21st century. We expected to see an impact in cohorts one to three schools given their tenure with STAT implementation. Principals, STAT teachers, and classroom teachers all expressed they believe STAT is having a positive influence on student engagement in classrooms. Participants expressed that they believe the increased engagement is a byproduct of improved instruction that is more student-centered and technology-driven. The observations findings align to some extent with these perspectives. During the observation, students were often observed using digital tools for learning, usually working independently. Multiple modes of student response, collaborative learning activities, and student discussions were observed with comparatively less frequency. Despite varying experience with STAT, the cohorts exhibited comparable practices in each of these areas. So our results suggest that the initiative is perceived by participants to have a positive impact on student engagement, but a neutral or potentially mixed impact on student behavior and teachers' ability to manage their classrooms. Overall, participants expressed mixed feelings with regard to the impact on student behavior and the ease of classroom management. 
Though principals, stat teachers, and classroom teachers indicated they feel the devices foster opportunities for improved student engagement, they also frequently discussed that students often misuse the devices and that this presents additional classroom management challenges for teachers. Recreational use of devices, both laptops and cell phones, was the most frequent problem behavior observed by teachers. Students not being prepared for class with devices, such as having the devices charged and present, was the second most frequently listed issue. As a result, middle school teachers frequently suggested that students keep the devices at school in a classroom laptop cart as opposed to taking them home overnight. To an extent, it appears as though the trends with device misuse may be somewhat cohort specific and may potentially be a temporary feature of teachers and students becoming accustomed to using the technology during the early We noted that off task or inappropriate student behavior with the devices was reported rarely or not at all by the majority of cohort one teachers. The majority of cohort two teachers reported these behaviors occurred occasionally or frequently. Then the majority of cohort three and four teachers, however, reported these behaviors occurred frequently or extensively. And those would be the less experienced cohorts. As with previous years during the classroom observations, OASIS 21 items related to 21st century type activities were observed frequently. Problem solving activities, learning that incorporates authentic or real world contexts, and project-based and inquiry-based approaches to instruction were all seldom observed during the classroom visits, regardless of the cohort. Of the four P21 items, the presence of learning that incorporates authentic real-world context was observed the most frequently across each of the cohorts. Less often were teachers observed incorporating project-based approaches to instruction. This trend is congruent with what has been found in observations from previous years. The district may consider offering targeted professional development to teachers regarding 21st century practices, as well as creating sample lessons that teachers might incorporate to further encourage use of P21 skills. The results provide a somewhat mixed picture with regard to the initiative's impact on student mastery of 21st century schools. As with previous years, classroom observation results um, indicated that P21 skills were observed infrequently. Problem solving activities, learning that incorporated authentic real world context, and project based and inquiry based approaches to instruction were seldom observed. The consensus this year among principals, stat teachers, and classroom teachers, however, was that the initiative is having a positive influence on student development of these skills. In particular, participants frequently highlighted the perceived influence of the initiative on improving students' ability to collaborate with one another. So there appears to be a slight contrast between the observation results, which showed infrequent use of activities with regards to P21 skills, and the perceptions expressed by teachers and school administrators in interviews, focus groups, and surveys. A possible interpretation is that students may be improving their P21 skills through activities that are not easily categorized through the domains um, targeted on our observation instrument. As a competing interpretation, it's also possible that participants' self-reported perceptions may be a limited measure of 20 learning. And last, the impact of the STAT initiative on student achievement was examined descriptively through MAP scores in both reading and mathematics for BC Lighthouse grades one through three, K four and five and six, as well as non-Lighthouse grades one through three. These grade groups encompass those in cohorts one and two, which have both participated in STAT for at least three years. The STAT logic model posits that measurable outcomes or measurable impacts on student achievement may, be, may begin to appear around this time period as changes to classroom environment and teacher, teacher practice have had time to permeate the district during the initiative's early years, leading to improvements in student engagement. So for MAP, we examined BCPS grades one through three, overall Lighthouse and non-Lighthouse. Lighthouse grades K four and five and Lighthouse grade six. For the park assessment, we examined BCPS grade three, Lighthouse grades four and five and Lighthouse grade six. So first, MAP for grades one through three. Grades one and two increased their average MAP mathematics and readings RIT scores across years while implementing STAT. The grade three scores remain comparable from 2015-16 through 2017, both subjects. All three grades consistently exceeded the national average of 50% of students at least meeting expectations each year of implementation. For MAP Lighthouse grades K4 and 5, 
For all grades, mathematics and reading, average RIT scores have remained relatively comparable across years as STAT has been implemented. Grades four and five exceeded the national average for meeting growth expectations in both subjects for all years, and there are no growth expectations for kindergarten. And then MAP Lighthouse grade six, average RIT scores for both math and reading have stayed consistent throughout the years implementing SAT. However, grade six consistently exceeded the national average of students meeting growth expectations each year of implementation for both subject areas. In terms of PARC, we are able to gather aggregated student achievement from the state of Maryland and comparison districts. So as we presented before, we have three different districts in the state of Maryland PARC results. It's important to point out there isn't an identical district to BCPS in terms of student demographics. So we have district A and B, which have a lower proportion of African American students and farms eligible students. And then we have District C, which has a higher proportion of African American students and farms eligible students. In terms of Baltimore County comparison to the state, the state has a slightly lower proportion of African American students and farms eligible students. So it's important to keep these in mind when we present the comparison data. Displayed on the screen is the mathematics proficiency change from 2014-15 and 2017-18. The bars illustrate the difference in the proportion of students at least meeting expectations during 2014-15, the first year of the park assessment, as compared with the most recent year of 2017-18. Both Lighthouse and non-Lighthouse grade three students exhibited an increase in the proportion of students at least meeting expectations. The proficiency change for Lighthouse students in elementary grades, which is three, four, and five, was greater than comparison districts in the state of Maryland. The proficiency change for Lighthouse grade six was positive, though lower than comparison districts in the state. So in terms of each year performance, for the percent of students actually meeting or exceeding expectations, grade three, both Lighthouse and non-Lighthouse, was stable, as was grade four Lighthouse. Grade five Lighthouse had an increased proportion of students meeting expectations over 2016-17 to 2017-18, the most recent year. And grade six Lighthouse had a slight increase for these same years. And then displayed on the screen is the ELA proficiency change between 2014-15 to 2017-18. Again, the bars illustrate the difference in the proportion of students at least meeting expectations during 2014-15 as compared with 2017-18. The proficiency change for Lighthouse students in elementary grades, three, four, five, was greater than comparison districts and the state of Maryland. The proportion of students at least meeting expectations declined for non-Lighthouse grade three and Lighthouse grade six. These two fell behind comparison districts and the state. So year to year differences for grade three, Lighthouse and non-Lighthouse, the proportion of students at least meeting expectations was stable from 2016-17 to 2017-18. Grade four and five Lighthouse, the same is true with a stable proportion of um, students at least meeting expectations. And then Lighthouse grade six exhibited a slight increase in the proportion of students at least expectations across those years. <coughs> so the last area we looked at was the perceptions of the STAT initiative. Our results suggest that overall, the STAT initiative is viewed favorably across a variety of stakeholder groups within the district. Principals and STAT teachers feel very positive towards the initiative and believe that having a positive impact on improving instruction, improving equity, and enhancing student learning. Overall, classroom teachers also highlighted quite positive experiences with the initiative, and many cited that they believe its greatest strength is helping instruction move in a more student-centered, individualized direction. Last, BCPS parents and students both indicated generally positive perceptions towards personalized learning and the use of instructional technology, further suggesting an element of support for the initiative. <coughs> Recommendations by the various participant groups took on several trends. Principals frequently recommended providing additional STAT teachers to particularly large schools. STAT teachers most frequently made recommendations centered on building more time into teacher schedules to plan and prepare for technology. Most frequently, classroom teachers recommended making more professional development available that's targeted to specific grade spans and content. 
Teachers also frequently indicated that they would benefit from be being provided more time and structured opportunities to learn about and experiment with programs that are currently available through BCPS 1. Finally, middle school teachers frequently re recommended that at the close of each day, rather than take the devices home, students store them in a laptop card at the school. Many teachers believe that this will address ongoing issues related to students failing to bring the laptops to school the next day or failing to keep them fully charged. So in conclusion, we found highly positive perceptions of STAT teachers, which I think is a finding that we've found every year. The STAT initiative is valued for moving instruction district-wide in a more student-centered direction. STAT's viewed positively by all stakeholder groups. And there are positive achievement trends on MAP, particularly for cohort one implementers. There are greater park mathematics and ELA proficiency changes in some grades, particularly Lighthouse four and five. And that's it. Questions? All right, do board members have questions of either Dr. Morrison or Dr. Ross has been quiet, but I'm sure he'll entertain questions. I'm providing support. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Brown, I'm sure, could answer questions too. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. I have a number of questions. Um, at the bottom of the page four of the report, and you mentioned this, uh, the, the suggestions that were made to BCPS, I'd like you to, to uh, go into a little more detail on these. The first one is that we implement strategies to prevent and address student off-task behaviors while using the devices, and that's something that um, board, the board has heard a lot about. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your findings were and what led to that recommendation? I think it came anecdotally through some classroom observations that we saw some students off task, whether it was using personal cell phones or devices. I personally saw a mixture. Um, but then we also heard from classroom teachers the need to help, I mean, I think teachers understandably need assistance in managing a classroom with kids on devices. And that but, recreate, okay, go ahead. But there is an interesting pattern, so I'll mm -hmm. contribute yeah, now. Yeah. <clears throat> and we'll have to see if this holds up, but the really interesting pattern is that the behavior problems and off-task behavior seem most pronounced when a cohort first starts. Mm -hmm. And the more experience they get, the less those problems. So that suggests, and we would actually expect that because in the beginning, kids are not used to using the devices, teachers are not used to teaching that way. So I'm not saying that everything is going to be good in the future as, as the cohorts move on. Teachers will continually need to deal with more sophisticated kids that figure out how to get into different websites and whatever. But it seems that once the teachers become more experienced than the kids do, things settle down. And that's an important finding, at least for now. Thank you. And those kids are aging as well, so hopefully they are maturing a bit <laughs> as they Hope go. Hopefully, so. yes. Um, can you define the recreational content that students are accessing? What, what kinds of content is that? I don't know if I have exact details, but they um, might access uh, the fantasy football type things. I know that's a hot topic. Uh, college students do. <laughs> um, but I know there's some kids want to go on um, cool math. Is it coolmath.com? Coolmath.org? Yeah. Cool math. yeah. So mm -hmm. kids want to go on math gaming sites, maybe when they're supposed to be doing ELA instruction, which in some ways it's nice to see kids motivated for math, but things like that are happening. So maybe not, it could, um, recreational could be kind of off subject, not entirely off complete educational topic. And what are you hearing anecdotally from teachers and whatnot as far as what that content is? Oh gosh, I'd have to go back to the raw data to tell you exactly. Because I can tell you that what I'm hearing is gaming, pornographic material, things that really should be caught, you know, by our firewalls. Mm -hmm. uh, the other recommendation on that page is that the district review policies allowing students to take devices home at the end of the school day, which you mentioned. Now, why is that being recommended? What, what concerns did you have on that? No, it was really interesting because um, 
I personally conducted a middle school focus group, and you know, I heard it there, and this was the first time I've heard this. I've, I've done the teacher focus groups for all the years, not all of them, but a handful of them, and it was the first time I heard that teachers were thinking, you know, maybe the solution is to not send the devices home because um, kids are forgetting to bring them back in, or they're using them in the evening, and then they come in without a device charged. Mm -hmm. So it ends up, you know, a, the teacher has to scramble and find an alternative. So, but when we went back to all of our notes, it was really pronounced in middle school, and we didn't hear that in elementary and high school. So it's worth, you know, considering across the board, but it was very pronounced in middle school. Um, and what alternatives were the teachers employing? Um, I heard uh, like a laptop cart where it could stay overnight and be charged. That was the strongest recommendation from middle school. At this point, what are teachers doing then? Are they charging the devices or? I think they have to come up with an alternative or try, yeah, try to charge it or come up with an alternative. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what those alternatives are that the teachers are employing. Mm -hmm. Good old paper and pencil, yeah. maybe. <laughs> um, or share, you know, you might have sharing of devices too. And, and I guess I've got a question then for staff. Um, I know there's been, um, a lot of talk um, among parents about signing the, uh, and I forget what it's called, the device use form you know, where they allows them to take the devices home. What is the BCPS policy if um, parents refuse to sign the form? How is that being handled? So again, um, all of the parents and principals have a process where we notify parents what the process is. Most of the time there is a, a meeting of sorts and then uh, to explain what that form is, what it means, what the responsibility is um, prior to parents having to sign. And as I uh, stated previously, um, we are certainly um, willing to answer all of the um, board's questions when it comes to the operations of the STAT initiative. And we'll collect all of those questions and have them available, those responses available uh, during the curriculum committee meeting. So thank you for that. So, so your answer is that it's being handed on an individual case by case. There's not a policy system wide on how that is to be Mr. handled. And Brielle, if you'd like to come forward to talk about um, how that's implemented so that we have you want to? So we have, um, the, in all of our schools, we have day users. In any of our buildings where devices go home, we have day users. Day, day use is different than loaners. Loaners would be, I forgot my device, I need a device to be able to use. But in all of our situations, we do have day use. So if a parent has not signed or um, in uh, unique situations, it gets to a point where they're not going to sign what, for whatever that reason might be we always have the option for day use. So that should not be disruptive to the child's school day if, if they're a day user? No, absolutely not. I mean, the, the process should be fairly smooth for most of our middle schools and high schools. Student would pick up the device at the beginning of the day, return it at the end of the day. And, the, and it'll be charged overnight, I guess? By the school, correct. By the school, okay, mm -hmm. thank you for that. Um, in the addendum on pages four to five where it shows the achievement data, I want to understand what I'm looking at here. Um, it shows the data on the lighthouse, um, districts A, B, and C, and state. Mm -hmm. Are the districts A, B, and C non-lighthouse, or is that a breakdown of the lighthouse? So we presented um, a breakdown of Lighthouse and non-Lighthouse, which would comprise, you know, overall Baltimore County. And then the other districts are other districts within the state of Maryland. So District A, B, and C is not BCPS? No, those are different districts. Okay. All right. So, so I'm looking at the grade four ELA on page seven. Oh, I guess I told you the wrong, <laughs> the wrong pages, but. Okay, I'm there. So that's the a comparison of the lighthouse to districts outside of BCPS. Mm -hmm. So um, just to help, so 2014-15 lighthouse was at 37.13, whereas District A was at 50.94, B was at 46. Hopefully that helps. So it's not a comparison within BCPS to lighthouse versus non-lighthouse. Correct. But, but I guess on some of the other pages it is. 
um, where are so we getting that? Non Lighthouse comparison? hasn't had enough time in grades four and five, like we always said we were going to present at year three and beyond. So next year is when four and five non Lighthouse would be presented. Okay. Grade three is where you have Lighthouse and non Lighthouse because they've been implementing for at least three years. Okay, so that, that's really, it's almost an a, almost non applicable comparison if we're not even cons comparing to non-lighthouse within our own school district? Well, we're comparing the 10 lighthouse schools that have had at least three years of implementation for your example is grade four as compared to what three other districts in the state are doing. And why didn't we compare to districts within our own county? Well, there's only one district in the county, Baltimore County? Yeah, so well, we did we different schools within our own county. Okay, so that's been our approach from the beginning because the lighthouse, it just has to do with the duration of experience with stat. We did do that for grade three because grade three non lighthouse has had at least three years of stat. Okay, yeah, that has me a little confused about how we as a board is supposed to look at this data. Um, now on pages four and five, it does show lighthouse, non-lighthouse, is that within BCPS? For grade three, yes. And then districts A, B, and C, which are outside of the county. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I had some input from um, some teachers uh, and parents. Uh, and, and I'm going to read you this um, because it, it, in reading the summary here of your report, it talks about how it's based, it's based primarily focused on professional development and then how professional development impacts student achievement. Indirectly, like you, it, it's the logic model. There's a flow of activities like inputs to get to the output. So one of the inputs is professional development that should help influence the classroom environment, the teacher practice, all those sorts of things. And then changes with the intermediary should impact outcomes like student achievement. Okay, so uh, one of the questions here is, if the STAT teacher provides professional development on instruction, how is the effectiveness of the strategies measured um, how are you judging effectiveness of that professional development? It's judged indirectly through student, student achievement. Okay. I mean, the quality of, of instruction is surely the strongest predictor of student mm -hmm. achievement. So we would hope that stronger instructional strategies via professional development would impact student achievement. But it really depends upon the goals of the professional development. When STAT was initiated four years ago, the goals, and correct me if I'm wrong because you've been on the ground more, but the goals of the professional development and of the um, STAT coaches, STAT teachers, stat teachers. Mm -hmm. was how to integrate technology. That's very hard. Um, STAT isn't a math curriculum. It's not a ELA curriculum. Um, it is a way of delivering instruction. It's a way of integrating technology, which in most districts really struggle with. So when we say, is the professional development effective, most teachers are saying, yes, I now know how to integrate technology. It's helped me to do that. Now, do the STAT teachers also have time and the expertise to teach you how to um, address each math standard in the Common Core? That's a different issue, and that's an issue that every district grapples with. But I think most teachers would say, Yes, we couldn't integrate technology before. Now we know how to do it. The kids seem happy, and the parents mostly seem happy. So that part has been successful. But teaching math and teaching ELA, that requires additional types of support. And STAT, per se, is not a, ma a curriculum. Right, it's just sounding cyclical to me, the way we're judging student achievement by looking at professional development, and we're judging professional development by looking at student achievement. That, that, that's the choice of a board. I wouldn't feel that way. 
Like I would judge professional development. I mean, that's based on what you're telling me. Like we don't have the capability with observations to really go in and see whether in a very granular or high reliable way, whether teachers are doing stat in a high fidelity way. We can learn through the quick snapshots we do, and we're seeing stuff. Uh, definitely use of computers and devices is much higher here than it is in other places. But we're still seeing direct instruction, and so we should. We also can go into classrooms and 40% of the time or 30% of the time, we won't see any devices being used. Is that bad? It's probably showing that teachers are using a variety of approaches because you can't use devices all day and address all the standards. So in part, I would address the quality of professional development in terms of teacher practice. But our evaluation can't do that in a very refined way. But what we're picking up from all the sources is teachers are generally saying we're happy. However, we would like more time from the stat teachers. We would like a full time. And so they should. But there's choices that you have to make involving budget and resources. Thank you. Um, on, on evaluating the program in general, um, I'm just going to talk about some things I'm hearing to set up for that. Um, I've, I've been hearing that when we rolled out this year for the start of this school year, there were a lot of devices that were rolled out that were already in disrepair. Um, there's, I've been hearing a lot about internet problems. As a matter of fact, DCPS1 was just down yesterday and today, and apparently it's been on and off uh, since the start of school. Um, Students are, can't access projects, homework assignments, teachers can't, they can't check test dates, um, employee emails down, uh, dropping internet connection even during testing. Um, so my question with this in mind is, um, well, one, I have several. One is I'm hearing that the, um, and this is a question for the system, that the daily tech assistants were pulled out, and I know we had discussed that when we looked at the contract, uh, that they were just going to be temporary, but with all these ongoing issues, I'm wondering how we determined at what point that would be pulled out, and how are we handling all of these ongoing technical issues? Yeah, so that is a system question and not a question for our people here at the uh, table. Could we get um, an agenda item on the next board meeting to answer these questions? Yeah, well, so I don't, I don't, I'm not sure about that, but I can, uh, we, can tr we can start trying to address that internally and see what we have time on the agenda for, sure. Well, I'm, okay, I'm, and I'm requesting that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. My next question. May I just interrupt one second, Mrs. Yes. Miller? Um, you've had the floor for 25 or 30 minutes, and I want to know if anybody else around the dais has questions. If not, um, uh, you're welcome to keep going forward, but there's a lot of hands up here. So how about, do you have one more question before we move on to somebody else? More. Okay. Did you want to move on and then come back to me? Sure. How about if we do Mrs. Hen? We'll just move around the, uh, the dais all the way around. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have two questions, both having to do with comments in the conclusion of the report itself um, that I would appreciate some clarity if you don't mind. Um, the first, then the report states, the impacts of STAT on student achievement remain encouraging but still indeterminate given the still relatively short duration of the initiative. Could you elaborate on that comment? So when we look at cohorts one, Cohorts one, two, three, and four, we were, obviously we've got cohort one that just finished their fourth year of STAT. And we have map data for cohort one, which appears to be promising. And we have park data for one grade within that cohort. Um, and we just started looking at student achievement for cohort two. So I still think it's, it's early and it takes time for teachers to adjust their approaches. We're even hearing now that teachers are starting to feel more comfortable. So I think that's what we're referring to. But even in the early stage, you could still predict with some degree of confidence what you might expect to see mm -hmm. 
in the other cohort. So the, the use of that term indeterminate leads one to think that there is no such pattern or trend that you could um, report at this point, or in fact the opposite, <laughs> that you, you may not expect to see the same results with the other cohorts. And I'm curious as to what the reasoning is there and what concerns you have in terms of expectations. <clears throat> I'd like to return to my earlier theme and see if it plays. <laughs> STAT in the early stages introduces teachers to how to teach in a different way, primarily using devices and primarily acquainting kids with 21st century skills. So the kids in Baltimore County are learning differently and they say it when you interview them. They say they have skills that they didn't have before that they appreciate. That has some value. It may not be the ultimate value that you want. It, or, and that a board wants in terms of student achievement. STAT is not a curriculum-based professional development type system. So the next step, so in the beginning, what we're seeing with STAT is generally positive trends, not off the charts. That's suggesting more engaged students, teachers that may be revived, not all of them, but many of them in some way, um, teachers, having the ability to put to have kids work on devices and teachers can go around and coach which you can't do when you're doing whole class instruction but what remains to be done is the common core standards in math and ELA do need to be addressed once teachers are comfortable with using devices and the um, other methods like using project based learning and more doing more coaching what you don't get big jumps in achievement just because you wheel devices in. So your teachers now can use the devices, but it takes time then to bring in curriculum changes. Like well, I'm looking at sixth grade or was looking at sixth grade. Maybe there's a problem with sixth grade. Not, it's not stat. Like I remember earlier today, one of the people who made a comment said, a principal, principal said they're uncertain whether we can attribute achievement results to stat. That's a really smart comment because so much is going on, including principal leadership and what kind of kids you're getting in the school. What we're hearing is, yes, the foundation appears to be there, but as of yet, we can't attribute it. The next step is now that teachers know how to use the devices, looking at the curriculum and looking at teaching the standards. STAT by itself doesn't do that in the first two or three years. I think, and also just um, in context, when we wrote the report that you have in front of you, we didn't have park data yet, and we make that point later in the paragraph of that, you know, we'll wait and see what park data shows because that will be a meaningful um, comparison with other districts in the state. So I think context is important too with that, with that statement. We're yeah, always I mean, the cautious. district's clearly <laughs> holding its own and even doing better. Mm -hmm. um, the map results show their, but that's not the end, that shouldn't be the end of the story. No, nor can we make that leap, even with modest gains, to attribute STAT to having a direct impact on student achievement. I'm not hearing that in what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong. I never think that there's an impact. With a broad scale initiative that's involving so much and there's so much else going on at schools. There's a curriculum that you're using. There's a curriculum in, in reading and English language arts. You have a math curriculum. That, those are very influential. There's school climate. There's training and leadership training that principals get. There's professional development that teachers get beyond that. There's teacher retention. There's a whole bunch of stuff. So that's why principals are saying, yes, I like what I see pretty much but I can't attribute the gains necessarily to STAT. STAT is huge. So what I'm hearing is that there are a lot of factors involved, which I think we all know to be the case, which would support a balanced investment across programs that all contribute towards student achievement. Yes. Thank you. My second question, um, again, a comment in the conclusion of the report reads, all key stakeholder groups, including students, parents, teachers, and principals, are generally supportive of its operation and continuance. Can you speak to the methods on how you collected that feedback for each of those stakeholder groups? So for parents, 
Well, let's see. Okay, back up. So principals, we conducted interviews. Classroom teachers, we did our survey and we had focus groups. Stat teachers, we conducted interviews. And then parents and students, um, well, students, we did focus groups. Parents, we did um, the climate survey, Baltimore County administers. Okay, so were there opportunities for anonymous feedback from principals, teachers? Um, teachers or survey is entirely anonymous. Students were randomly selected. Parents could opt, um, parents had to <coughs> opt in to let us interview or have their students or children participate in the focus groups and we randomly selected from those that were returned. So teacher stakeholder surveys, but otherwise um, principals were conducted through I mean, interviews. As part of our study, we do share informed consent, which lets them know that any response that they share with us is entirely anonymous. And I can tell you that classroom teachers in particular are very forthcoming with their feedback to us. Could you give us some examples of some <coughs> feedback that when you say generally favorable, what were some comments you heard that may have been on the less favorable side or did those factor into your recommendations? Mm -hmm. They are always in our recommendations and we do make sure to present any like maybe less than positive comments in our report. So when you go into the actual sections, then we give um, like we'll include quotes. We did, I know I can think of one specific example that's in the report and I'd have to take a minute to actually find it, but we did um, report that if Definitely one, if not two, phase two schools had concerns over their stat teacher and the role that they were serving and the degree to which they were providing professional development. So that's a specific example. I just want to add one quick yeah. thing. As you, you know, consider stat and all the findings, because there's so many findings from four years, I, I need to say these are unusual results because virtually for every evaluation that we do for different districts across the country, last year we did about three other major ones. They all have principal, same principal interviews, teacher surveys. These are unusual results. Last year for three other initiatives that we evaluated, and I won't name the, the particular uh, programs, we had much more negative um, inputs from teachers, from students, from principals, and uh, these are unusual for four straight years. So for whatever reason, it seems that generally speaking, the stakeholders here, the participants, are positive overall. And I can honestly say I haven't seen that in a large scale district evaluation. In a, in a neighboring district that I won't mention, it's very large, we did a curriculum evaluation last year. The survey results were very negative from teachers and that district is changing its curriculum despite making a tremendous financial investment in it. So the results here every year being the same are unusual. So I'd like to share a note I received from a former BCPS teacher regarding this and would like to hear your, your thoughts on how you maybe mitigated these concerns in collecting that feedback. Um, she writes, do you know how much intimidation took place during the first three years of STAT? Any teacher who questioned its efficacy was highly pressured to write positives. Fact. <clears throat> That's a principal who needs some professional development. But we haven't heard that from many teachers, or any, actually. So I think it is important also to mention our sampling approach. So um, with classroom teachers, we, we at CRRE randomly select the teachers to participate. So I don't, I don't know these teachers personally. I'm just pulling in names. Groups. Yep, in yeah. the focus groups. So we're just pulling names out of a hat and asking for them. So. And that random sampling does help so that there isn't bias one way or another. And what assurances did you provide them? In addition, I know you mentioned keeping their information confidential, but. Yep, so we, um, for our, we have an uh, IRB so that we have to have informed consent and we go through the procedures with anyone that we interview or survey, but particularly interviews and focus groups, everyone gets a copy of the informed consent that says that in no way, shape or form will we ever name their name, their school or any identifying information whatsoever. <coughs> so everything is anonymous. We keep no records and we tell them this. We don't have record. I don't, I actually don't even know anyone's name when I go into a room. I, I mean, I just know who I'm supposed to meet, but that's it. I don't know who's who. Was there a mechanism or invitation to provide feedback for those that weren't selected at random to provide anonymous feedback to you? They do give their feedback through the survey, which is anonymous. So um, they know, 
you know, we put in our informed consent that, and it, it's coming from Hopkins, it's coming from our Hopkins email address, so they should know that Baltimore County isn't seeing the results, but we do state in the informed consent at the start of the survey that, you know, responses are completely anonymous. You're never going to be tied back to your school or your name or anything like that. And they have an open-ended section where they can comment about, like, what's going well, what's not going well, what needs to be improved. And those were sent to their BCPS email address? Yes. And it's an anonymous survey, so it opens in a different platform, like a different, it opens in a website. It's not that they email their responses to us. Okay. That's all I Ms. Had. Mrs. Causey, let's try everybody to keep 10 or so minutes at each one around the table, because we've got plenty of people who want to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that presentation. Thank you for the work that you've done. Um, I've been on the board for three years, so I've seen your presentations, and I do appreciate the time um, that you put into them. Um, just to dovetail a bit with Ms. Hen's commentary with intimidation and uh, encouragement, if teachers know that the administration wants this program to succeed, it makes sense that they would respond to that pressure and try and facilitate what the desire is. Um, and we've heard that that comment from Ms. Hen is not, is not alone. Um, and we also had uh, the former superintendent who said at a meeting that he would stake his career on this initiative. So this wasn't just a little bit of encouragement, a whisper here and there. There's been uh, widespread pressure. Um, so it's not surprising that the teachers and principals report that technology integration is occurring. Mm -hmm. Of course it is. They, do they have a choice? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's one thing to dovetail with Ms. Hen. Um, the other thing in terms of the overall report and the overall commentary is that what has occurred in BCPS is an experiment. Yes, Mr. Ross is shaking his head. I'm, I'm shaking my head because every new initiative that happens in any district is an experiment because no other district has done exactly the same thing. But go ahead. Yes, and as a parent with a student in this laboratory, it's important that we make decisions that are the best for the students. That is, and that means for them, besides the whole child issues that we deal with, with nutrition and health and social emotional health, um, is academic achievement. And so what we're hearing is that we're having some increases in some areas in academic improvement, but it's indeterminate that it's because of this. Um, and I have issues with that, uh, especially given the scale of the money, time, and investment that's being made on this initiative. Um, the issues that I wanted to transition to a bit because some of the issues have already been addressed by other questions and I want to give appropriate time to my fellow board members is um, how was the recent implementation of 30,000 additional laptops to all high schoolers evaluated or has that yet been evaluated by Johns Hopkins? That's this year. Yes. So we start observations next month and oh. student focus groups next month. Okay. Um, so are you familiar with the support model for the STAT initiative? I don't, I don't In think. In terms of how many techs we have per the number of devices that we have implemented, the number of repairs over the summer? No, that's not, that's outside the scope of our evaluation. Okay, so that's outside of the scope. Um, would it be fair to say that if there is insufficient help desk support, that that's going to negatively impact the students that are now using laptops in this experiment with more and more digital curriculum? It's outside of our scope. Okay. So. Well, because I, I heard pretty clearly from our president of TABCO that the teachers are feeling that there's uh, issues with this transition to digital curriculum and with increasing um, pull on the system, and maybe it's the 30,000 laptops all at once on the system. I mean, um, we will, so we're going to conduct teacher focus groups again in the spring. And, surveys, and right. you know, and we can, I mean, I'm sure if it's, if it's an ongoing issue or something important that needs to be raised, I'm sure teachers would tell us that. Okay, but right now it's, it's outside of your scope. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
when was the last teacher and principal input session? In the spring. In the spring. So we do teacher focus groups, stat teacher interviews, and principal interviews in the spring of each year. Okay, so those are all face-to-face, -face. they're not anonymous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then do you consider the laptop itself, the device that's chosen to deliver the instruction and in the curriculum? No, that's no. outside of our scope. Do you consider the dollar costs of the implementation? We do not. So that's outside also outside of, of your scope. Um, so you don't consider whether a low cost device could achieve similar results? Okay. And um, as for the survey, where you talk about in general that there's generally parent approval, um, I am a parent. So I review the, the survey, and I can say that if there's technology-related questions that they're not direct in terms of would I support this versus other supports for teachers and instruction. So, so we are tasked with examining the BCPS climate survey, and one of the items says <coughs> personalized learning provides teachers the opportunity to meet student needs. Another item is access to technology increases opportunities for personalized learning. And we've reported the questions exactly as they are, and we've made every effort to not misinterpret what's being asked. But the responses, I mean, the majority are positive. So those questions are de designed by the system, not designed by Johns Hopkins. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and then do you... Um, take into account um, the discipline when you talk about behaviors. You're talking about what you observe in the classroom in terms of off-task or on-task behaviors, so or have you correlated suspensions and behavior reporting? We ask teachers, um, one of our survey items every year is the degree to which you observe off-task behavior with devices, and if a teacher prompts, or um, if a teacher answers, like, no, not at all, then they move on. But when they report, like, yes, it is happening in our classroom, then we ask, we have an open-ended section for teachers to report, like, what specifically they are seeing in the classroom. And then we also gather suspension data from the schools and attendance data that's in the report. Okay, thank you. And then last, I mean, I guess you have your scope and your focus and your evaluation. And part of it is how to integrate technology into classrooms. The qu bigger question that we at the board need to answer is are we allocating our resources appropriately, effectively, um, ethically? Is it ethical to put the whole system's children into an experiment when we have needs that are unmet, when we have instructional um, supports that teachers are telling us will help them increase student achievement, increase uh, school climate in a positive way if they have additional supports in the classroom. So the bigger question for us is, are we allocating those resources? Are we getting the results that we are obligated to provide that opportunity to our children, which is to have the best academic outcome that they can. So um, those are the questions that we need to wrestle with. Um, the other thing is, uh, earlier on you um, correlate some of the data with um, nationwide data. We don't correlate, but we do present descriptively uh, where BCPS Lighthouse compare with the other districts in the state. Okay, and then in one of the charts you um, talk about comparing it side by side with yeah. a nation, with a nation. No, with the state, state of Maryland. Oh, the MAP, MAP RIT score, um, the national averages are 50%. Yes, okay. Yes. I'm thinking park, because that's what's. <laughs> yes, which is going away. That's what I heard. In a year, <laughs> yes. Um, so. Maryland State Department of Education um, in August 28th of 2018 put together a study and the purpose was to present the state board with the results of the 2018 administration of the Partnership of Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers tests. And um, one of the things that I was looking over um, related to the changes from the previous year by LEA 
English language, grades three to eight. And it puts Baltimore County six from the bottom. So quite below state average. And the other thing that it's indicating is that we're on a downward trend for the number of students that have a level four or higher performance. And for me, that's where the rubber's hitting the road and it's concerning. Um, the other uh, report that they generated was a map talking about the change in percent of students at performance level four or higher um, and their direction. So green is relatively headed in the right direction and pink red is not. So we're in a downward trend according to the Maryland State Department of Education. So what grade, I mean, I haven't seen this. So what grades are reported on? These are grades three through eight. Okay. Aggregated, and all combined, I take it? Yeah. Okay. I'll be happy to send it to you. No, I can locate it, but I, yeah. I think it um, doesn't paint and I'll just quite do one the last picture one. By, by presenting three through eight aggregated because you've got different experience and stats. So, and, yeah. and that's a good point because I wanted to talk about aggregating in a minute. Um, so the other one is for math. Nope. Oh, this is LEA 10. Uh, LA so, probably. Like Sorry, arts? they do LEA and okay. then ELA. Okay. So it's alphabet soup here. Um, and Baltimore County is fourth, fourth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's um, fourth from the bottom and with a negative trend. Um, and they have uh, similar maps for math. Um, and I would like this report to be attached to board docs um, as also providing information about how our students are doing and how um, all of this composite of initiatives is impacting our students. Um, so um, so I'd, I'd like to go around and have questions that address the report instead of us having talking kind of monologues about um, other things. So if you can stay okay, focused have, on I'll a question for her and then move on so that we can keep going. Okay. And so one of the things we were talking about aggregating and how things are being combined and not combined. One would hope that if we have a lighthouse model where the stat teacher is helping and where supports are coming in for professional development, that the progress that they're able to make in four years won't take the next cohort four years to make. The point is having the lighthouse schools lead the way by uh, shortening the amount of time, shortening the amount of experimentation that's then happening with the other groups. I mean, would you say that's a fair statement or are you not seeing that? Are you seeing that every school, no matter when it starts, has to go through the same growth model? I think there are a lot of factors involved. I think, you know, in every, every school is gonna be unique. The demographics that they're serving is one, but we know from the research literature that teachers' beliefs and attitudes are strong predictors to the degree to which they integrate technology. So I think you've got a lot of different variables. I don't think you can say, I'm going to do it in this many years in the lighthouse, and then bam, it's going to happen in one year. It, it should go faster, yeah. Yeah. but you need to do, you can't do the same thing you did four years ago. Four years ago, and for the past few years, the goal was to um, provide professional development, training, and a culture where teachers were using devices in a natural way in their teaching. And I'm not saying that that's been fully accomplished, but great strides have been made throughout the district. Now you have kids coming through the pipeline who are used to learning in that way. So things should go faster, but the focus now should be on curriculum and whether the curriculum serving the purpose and how the technology, the teaching using the technology is integrated with teaching to the standards. And if that is all done, it should go faster in terms of raising achievement. <coughs> devices by themselves and using devices and using de um, project-based learning by itself doesn't raise achievement unless you're teaching the curriculum well. So, are so you we have the so foundation there really well and it should go faster. So are you saying that the focus was on the technology and not on the curriculum for the last uh, uh, four I'm years? I'm saying that STAT is not a curriculum. I understand that, but we need curriculum to work, and it sounds right. as so if what you're is saying is- So that is probably the next focus in terms of where to, that's for you all right. to decide. Mr. But Yulfelder. you have a good foundation. Thank you, thank you. 
You know, I'm, I'm an old timer, so to me, I still look at the 80-20 rule. And when I hear these negatives, I wonder out of our 9,000 teachers and a couple hundred principals, you know, how many really uh, do we have to listen to from a negative to say, well, that's a trend and that permeates through all our teachers? I, I don't, I'm, I mean, we, we hear from such few negatives and everybody's trying to say these negatives overshadow everything else. I got a, a couple questions, a, a real simple question. It apparently, you, you guys have evaluated um, technology introduction into districts throughout the country. When you compare Baltimore County and the way we did it, irrespective of how much money, because no one can ever say that you spent too much or too little or you wasted it, and the results of that will come years from now. I go to graduations. I don't see us graduating less kids. I don't see kids get, not getting into the same colleges they did before. I mean, I don't know what the true test is, but when you look at these things in, in, a, in a larger context, guess what? I think we're doing very well. In fact, all the students I talk to uh, seem to have accomplished something when they get out of school. Yeah, we have some who don't. Back to 80-20. I'll take 80-20. Almost any time. I, I wish I had 80-20 the lottery tonight. Uh, but in any event, what, what's your evaluation overall without going into uh, very small specifics about a couple, maybe a couple teachers negative and a principal who said this and someone else who said that. You know, the principal could have been uh, an individual who got uh, dismissed or moved around and wasn't happy. So what's your overall evaluation of Baltimore County our staff program compared to others that you've done throughout the nation, comparable size, you know, districts. You've done more than me. <laughs> <laughs> I've done too many. Um, I could honestly say that given the goals of implementation, Baltimore County's done an incredible job. But I also hear what you're saying in terms of test scores and where to go next. There's more to do. But in turn, integrating technology is really hard. Teaching in new ways is really difficult. Having um, tech, uh, uh, the uh, internet go offline, having breakdowns, having compute, it's a whole new way of teaching and it's difficult. And I think in the first four years, an incredible job has been done setting up that foundation. And so there's more to do. And it is interesting that every single cohort, we've gotten the same results in terms of the pattern and in terms of the survey. Uh, I just want to push back a little bit on the survey thing. It's very rare that a principal or somebody can intimidate teachers on an anonymous survey where they will put all strongly agrees because they know that their future, if they don't like what they're doing, they know that their future is being determined by saying, I agree, I agree, I agree. Uh, you know, there might be some that feel that Big Brother is watching the little marks they put in, but we see negative results from districts where there is big money and big priority putting in on the success. I don't think teachers took the survey and worried about the former superintendent's goals. I think if they didn't like what was happening, they would write in, and some did, that this is not the right direction, this is the wrong way to go. And we didn't see much of that. You done? Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Stewart. Thank you. So just to circle back to the grade six proficiency changes, um, I think that you, you had already discussed it, and Dr. Ross in particular, regarding this issue, but the analysis that was done, that, does that give you any more insights as to the factors that may be relevant there? Is it about the, just the period of time of implementation that those students have had the devices? Is there any sort of additional information we can glean from this? Sixth grade results. The sixth grade, so sixth grade did not, they were kind of the outlier in terms of the elementary grades are, are stronger. It's hard to connect stat with that because yeah. we're not seeing, we're not doing an implementation of sixth grade for, so we don't have, we can't say that sixth grade used the devices better. Um, I mean, to get, just give you an honest answer, my first thing would be to look at the sixth grade curriculum mm -hmm. and talk to the teachers at the sixth grade and coaches at the sixth grade and say, is there anything, and I'd look at the standards at the sixth grade 
is there anything we're not doing here? I mean, that would explain it better than STAT, in my opinion. Okay. With respect to the project-based approaches and the fact that I think folks believe that we weren't really maximizing the use of the devices as it relates to that type of approach, do we have a sense of the kind of factors that could be contributing to that, whether it's devices inherently propel people to be in their own corners as opposed to being <laughs> collaborative? So you're talking about kind of two different things. Project-based, you can do on an individual basis. That's true, fair enough. Yeah, or, yeah. or collaborative learning. Or collaborative, collaborative learning, I'm sorry, yeah. I heard you use so that phrase collaborative. Um, when we've often talked to kids, kids often say that they would prefer to work alone. <laughs> a lot. I mean, they just they would rather work alone. They think that Susie Smith is just going to be off task and she's going to distract me, and so I just want to work on my own, my own thing and get it done and you know do other things. So it's often a student preference. The students, when we do student focus groups, they often tell us that they're given the choice of working with a friend or working in a group or working by themselves, and it's yeah, it seems more student driven. We know about the difficulties of working together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have reported um, on improvements that can be made, to be sure. Did you uncover trends or facts that would suggest that wholesale changes are necessary to the STAT program, maybe even scrapping it it's in, in its entirety? No, nothing that would lead anyone towards that. Okay. I think it's minor tweaks. You know, asking for middle schools to middle school kids to leave their devices at home, that's like a wonderful recommendation that's so easy to check if you want to, so compared to what you could have. Okay. Uh, we've talked about student achievement being one of the ways to uh, look at this program to analyze a metric. Um, what are some of the other top-level metrics do you think that have um, some relevance to the conversation about, you know, quote-unquote success of the program? Is it, you know, like feedback from teachers and principals and yeah, students? I, I mean, I personally thought it was really encouraging that principals spoke of teachers increasing their collaboration with their peers, you know, so having that stronger connection, which surely impacts student climate within a school, because teachers are more engaged with their practices. But then also, you know, we, um, I think a consistent theme was a positive impact on student engagement, which is important. Right, as an overarching trend, mm -hmm. right. And, and looking down the road, you know, I'd also want to look at graduation. I haven't had time to mm -hmm. move up the pipeline, but I think graduation rates, post-secondary preparation, um, there's other measures that we don't look at, such as school climate. I think it would be interesting to have a measure of technology skills, like the student's ability to use technology in creative ways, like we have to do at the workplace. Because right. I do think you're preparing your students in that way. Do you think? I mentioned in one presentation that some of the kids in BCPS have stronger PowerPoint skills than people I know. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Um, is that sort of a natural progression of where this type of analysis will go as the program itself is broadened out and over time incorporated in more grades? Uh, the present year is the last year of our evaluation. Of, a, of the evaluation, but yeah. you'll be getting data every year right. on the test scores and graduation rates and you know we'd be glad to um you know provide technical assistance or whatever we've been with you a long time yeah fair yeah. enough um has any response that you've received to a survey or to an in-person interview suggested that um people or they are being pressured into giving a singular answer i've never heard that and i i honestly um when we were coordinating data collection activities for this fall i stressed to bcps i love the classroom teacher focus groups if we want to scale back principals or stat teachers that's fine but the classroom teacher focus groups are probably the most valuable source of information and i honestly believe that so why do you, why do you say that um i think they're most likely to be honest, brutally honest, they're most likely to say what isn't working. And they've given you is. negative feedback before. Yeah. And we have heard it from principals. I mean, I distinctly remember a principal interview maybe a couple years ago. Okay. Uh, have you had or felt like you had the requisite independence to provide your own analysis and make your own conclusions that you can call your own? Yes. I, um, I in conversations with Steve and others, I always say how much I appreciate that Baltimore County lets us do our work as compared to some clients that want to mess with reports. <laughs> they would like to write the reports themselves, but you know. Okay, good to hear. So uh, I think that speaks to the next question, but I would like it to be answered anyway, which is have you felt unduly encumbered or limited in discharging your obligations and conducting the analysis? Never. 
Okay. I, I stand by all of the results in our report. Great, thank you. Ms. Adekoya. Um, amazing presentation. <laughs> it's been so long. Congrats. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so I had a couple questions. When thinking about rolling out such a large project to a whole county, the studies, I wasn't, this is my first year, the study was brought to the table with the lighthouse to, because you've seen the progression, you've seen the positives, so you inspired the whole bringing it out to the whole county. Well, we didn't. Oh, okay. Oh, we were just tasked sure. with evaluating it. Mm -hmm. But it, there was a study done prior to bringing uh, it out to the whole year. county. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now my question is, even if you want to see it as an experiment, in a sense, you have a theory, you have a hypo hypothesis, you have an objective. And Baltimore County's objective <laughs> is to ha build kids up to be 21st century ready, which includes technology. Mm -hmm. So when you look at technology, you look at it as in stat is going to be apparent. Integrating computers and devices is going to be apparent in building kids up to be 21st century ready. Mm -hmm. So now my question now is, when you look at STAT, it's more of a teacher doing a diagnostic on, oh, which one works better for you, visual, auditory, or what's the last one? Kinesthetic. Or kinesthetic. It's one of those just additional tools, like you can integrate this into your classroom, and a student will work better with being on a device. It's not a curriculum, like you said countless, <laughs> countless of times, you said, it's not like English, it's not like math where a student would sit in a class for 90 minutes and go through a computer. It's more of what additional skills or what new teaching style can we add for students to be better thriving when they leave a BCPS system? Okay, so now... So I could, um, I could print out our report and give it to you on paper, mm -hmm. or I could email it to you. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't understand it, is it the fault that I emailed it to you? No. Or is it my my report? So you're, <coughs> yeah. So now with the question, my other question was regarding middle school. So if a student is um, told to leave the device in class, would that mean that they're not getting any homework that requires them to be on a device? So the middle school teachers addressed this, um, and I'm sure others know way more about homework in middle school than I do, because that was a a long time ago. Um, but they seem to think that the benefit of keeping the device in the classroom to make sure it is 100% ready for the next day outweighs any concerns mm -hmm. with homework, mm -hmm. and that they would deal with it. Like they, you know, it was something that they accepted. So now my question is, when you look at the data from the first year, you still have to realize that this is a whole new teaching system. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take the overlook of couple of years before you say that this has failed us and this isn't the best and sure. it was a waste because it's never a waste of resources and time and effort especially when you're talking about children and their education but you still have to keep the open mind that it's not just one year data that will determine the functionality of this rollout mm -hmm. so I have one more question I can't remember I can't remember I can't remember, I can't remember. okay that's it, that's it <laughs> Mr. McDaniels thank you um, just a comment and then a question. Um, I just want to start out by saying I think all the issues that uh, Ms. Miller brought up about um, internet downtime and off-task behavior and device issues are certainly a part of what we're experiencing. Um, everybody, I think, is, is, is accepting that there, there are challenges that we have. I just wanted to say before the um, budget process that we went to, I uh, went to at least a half dozen elementary schools in my councilmatic district and talked about STAT and the devices. And the feedback I got was very similar to the general comments that you have included in your report that the principals were favorable to it, the teachers were, were very supportive of the effort. Um, but in the schools that I um, visited, they talked a lot about the equitable access to information of their students. And for me, um, that's kind of intuitive at the high school level, but I was gonna ask if you have any comments that or you received from your interviews um, that would talk about how the STAT program has uh, lifted the equ equitable uh, education of our kids. That did come up as a theme, I think from, I'd have to look, if it was classroom teachers, um, brought up the importance of equity, and that was like a major benefit that they saw of the initiative. Oh, that's recommendations. 
stat teachers, principals and stat teachers, notably talked about the importance of equity within their schools that stats oh. offered. Okay, because again, Baltimore County is very diverse and, and the schools that I visited, I think are gonna be maybe not representative of Baltimore County as a whole, but that came up quite a bit in the area that I uh, visited. And I was surprised at the, at the at, at, at those comments were made at the elementary school level as opposed to maybe higher mm -hmm. level students. Mm -hmm. I don't know the details, but it would be interesting to understand, you know, what proportion of students wouldn't have access mm -hmm. without STAT. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Birch. Thank you, Ed. Um, I, uh, you know, go around to, to my schools. I talk with parents. I talk with, with kids. I was just on a bus uh, going to uh, one of our middle schools in the sixth district, talking with kids about their devices. Um, I, I, I talk to teachers. Generally, you know, you ask folks, especially kids. You ask kids, they'll tell you. I mean, there isn't, a, there isn't any, you know, They're not worried about the pressure thing. Uh, they may know what you want to hear, but just as often, perhaps especially if they're middle school students, they're looking to tell you what you don't want to hear. Um, and I, as I talk to teachers, I mean, I, you know, I identify myself, I say who I am. Uh, generally, they are not in the least bit, I mean, intimidated. They, they very much will just tell you. And I've had teachers tell me uh, they're, you know, what they thought uh, about the, uh, the initiative to do devices to every kid, uh, whether they looked at it equitably, whether they looked at it as a net gain, whether they looked at it as uh, rejection of the of past teaching concepts or, or rather teaching approaches because it's it's just like another tool not to dismiss it as a very expensive tool but it's really unlike most of the tools that went before it because of its dynamism um, there's just there's just so many things that happen through this device um, vast majority of parents that I've spoken with love the idea of their kid having a device, love the idea of their kid having, kid having a device that gets updated, that they don't have to go and arrange to, you know, to pay for it. They very much like that idea. Many of them, they use technology on the job that they have and they see it as a natural progression. Uh, my parents wanted me to do two things in, in, uh, in high school, take driver's ed and learn to type. Hmm. The only two things my parents were concerned about, uh, you can take, pick, you know, pick out the rest of the things that you wanted to do, uh, turned out to be extraordinarily good advice from, from my parents. Um, I, I wanted to say this, I was, I was very pleasantly surprised because it, it was like December, I went to a, a holiday concert at a middle school. And I get the principal, who's had a long day, but who was really very relaxed, and we're talking about different things. And I was, well, now we have devices in our middle schools. How's that going? And uh, she immediately went to the issue of kids coming to school without their devices. And then she, and she says, or the device isn't charged. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I haven't heard this in the, like the elementary schools. I haven't heard any of that occurring. And I, and I said, so, so what do you do? Well, we have a, you have another device for them, but you can sort of see where this is kind of going. And I sort of said, well, you know, based on your, and I use this sort of expert, you know, question, based on your knowledge, training experience as a middle school principal in, in our system and in this particular district, um, if you had to estimate, what would be the percentage? And she says 15%. I'm thinking, you know, I said, well, I just heard Mr. Imbriali say, you know, well, we have these, these loaners that we can give out and, you know, like, you know, kids, if somebody didn't sign something, we can get advice to them. So when you take a look at some like the enrollments of some of the middle schools that impact my district, I mean, we're talking about like, like in a Parkville Middle School, not that there are 15%, but if you use that, it's about 170 kids a day, uh, like 195 at Pine Grove, 116 in Stemmers, not quite 300, 285 at Perry Hall Middle School. I don't, I mean, I asked her, I said, you know, what do you think it is? She didn't have an answer. I, I can't, for the life of me, figure it out. Maybe in the elementary school, the parents are, figure the kids are, uh, you know, we, we got we to stay on the kids to get it done. Make sure you got this, make sure you got that, make sure you got this, make sure it's plugged in, and make sure you leave with it, and I'm there to make sure that you're walking out the door with it. Um, as the kids are in the middle school, maybe, the, I mean, there's less of that going on. I mean, I don't think there's, you know, 300 homes, although we do have homeless populations. I don't believe there's all these homes that don't have electricity. I can't, I can't figure out, I can't fathom why that 
occurs. Uh, but it, but it, the principal was the first thing she said in December of last year. And then here I am listening to this, you know, you're here during your normal time. They kind of give us like an update as to what's going on. And there it right is, right in my face saying, there are kids coming without their devices in middle school. I don't have an answer for it, and it's going to have to be up to our system to sort of kind of get a handle on just exactly what that is. Um, I wrote down this, this quote, and if I have it wrong, Baltimore County Public Schools are more than holding its own and modest gains. Is that an accurate? It's an accurate quote from what we can see from the data that we have and have presented to you. We didn't see the state report. Mm -hmm. We haven't had an opportunity to look at Baltimore County data controlling for student um, demographics. Um, academic achievement in every state is very correlated. You can line up the districts almost in terms of percent low income and how they score in the state tests. So we're looking at broad measures from 10,000 feet up based on these charts that are in our report, based on the map scores. It looks like Baltimore County is more than holding its own. But if you ask me to testify about how the district is really doing, I want to see more granular data. So we're, we're looking at aggregated data across grades and, and so on. But yes, that's an accurate quote of what we're seeing. Well, I don't think anyone is not looking for more granular data. And um, I'm of the sense that it is not a quick fix, quick turnaround with other trends with a student population as diverse as our own. My district, a lot of Title I schools at the elementary, obviously elementary of Title I's. Uh, we have high farm populations. Uh, I mean, parents genuinely like the idea that this was done in a very equitable way, if they may not use that word. And the idea that principals and stat teachers are using the word equitable, whether that's a handy vocabulary word for them to use or not, the obvious fairness of how these devices have been distributed and the resources that, that follow have been distributed, that may, and it's just speculation, but that may be reflected in the results of folks saying, that the majority is supportive, that the, the majority of folks spoken with have positive feelings about the STAT program. The business we're in, though, is not about generating positive feelings. It doesn't hurt. But the, you know, the business we're in is about the future. It's the future for the kids. And from the parents I speak with, as I mentioned earlier, they see a direct line between their use of technology right now and into the future and their kids use of technology into the future, grateful that they're being able to test all that now. Anyway, those are my comments. Ms. Eaton. A lot of questions have been asked and answered. Thank you. Mr. Young. All right, how about, how about if Ms. Miller gets the last bite here? <laughs> um, thank you. There was some data presented, and I don't know whether it was in the presentation or in the documents here, uh, regarding the device time, student device time. Um, how was that data collected? The only device time we do is the extent to which devices are used in the 20 minutes that we're in the classroom. So we do not have a hard number of you know, in minutes. X number of classrooms, it was used for 10 minutes. We, we don't have that, so. So 20 minutes, was that the totality of your visit to a classroom? Yes, 20 we're minutes. in a classroom for 20 minutes. Okay, okay. so you have some, so there whatever, are some device, classrooms whatever we, data you collected during that time. There are some have. classrooms we would go in and devices weren't used for the entire duration of the 20 minutes. I don't know what happened before we walked into the classroom or what might happen after we left, but during that 20 minutes, no devices used. There are other classrooms we might walk in and five kids are on devices and no one else is. So it just varies, but we don't have a stopwatch calculating that. 
Um, but you have data saying what grade that was, maybe what class, you know, with language arts or phys ed. We aggregate. Or, I mean, yeah, we could go back. Well, we don't that you observe phys ed, but we go back, you know, we would have like grade four, you know, but it's on an individual school to basis. We aggregate it all when we do the analysis by right. cohort. Right, but you have that data, non-disaggregated. It's not stopwatch data, though. It's still not time. It, it's indicating yeah. the percentage of time you see a particular event. These are called snapshot evaluations. So instead of staying in a teacher's class for like a whole day and making the teacher real nervous, we walk around for 20 minutes and take many pictures, okay. assuming that over many, many pictures, if it's happening, the picture will, pictures will capture it more or less. Well, those pictures are more than we've gotten so far. So would it be possible for you to send the board that disaggregated data? I don't even, so I don't even know what that would look like. So we would send you every single observation result, like every classroom observation all regarding. Yeah, we're not allowed, yeah. So our IRB, um, yeah, does not allow us to share raw data with a client. We can share our analysis, but we're not because of confidentiality concerns. Well, yeah, I'm not sure what concerns it would be. You mean there because would be your a problem, name? Problem, Jennifer, with IRB. If somebody wanted to come over to our center and look at the data, I don't know because we have records, so our observation data is linked. I would feel comfortable with that. Like if somebody was interested and wanted to spend a few hours. You know, I guess it's like going to a law library or something. <laughs> um, we could provide you with the data and a place to work, and you could look over it as long as you didn't leave with it. But well, I think I mean, IRB would have a problem if you left with it. You presented a certain level of data to us already. I'm asking whatever level of detail that you could give us so that I, would, that I would give us, you, provide us with the let, let Dr. Brown speak yeah. for a second. Let, let me chime in briefly here because our IRB might have an issue with oh, this. Oh, that, that's right. Um, we do not have access to this information intentionally so. So I don't know when Dr. Morrison goes into a classroom in one of our buildings and makes observations, I don't know which classroom she's been in. And I certainly don't have the observations um, by classroom or by teacher to, to peruse. There could be identifying information actually I, on the that's, page. That's my yeah. concern is that your sheets yeah. will have identifying they would, information. They could have something where you and, could and figure out who And we would be violating the confidentiality of the teachers involved. So, so you know, I mean, I, I don't care what, you know, teacher it was or what school it was even, if it could be identified that it was this grade, this class subject and what your findings were um maybe we an air you know uh, an I'm area of the you county you always want to be transparent you know with board members who need to make decisions let's revisit that um right i know we can't show you the actual yeah sheets that we record stuff on but redacted I or I would be compiled. comfortable if the IRB people said, okay, with you looking at an Excel spreadsheet that had, data. it's really boring, but right. you, but if you wanted to come over and Bore look at me. it, you could, you could this, look that's at That's why we're called a board. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So okay. let's revisit could, that and you could email and, you know, at some point and say, hey, if, you know, what do you think? <laughs> okay. Appreciate that. Um, regarding <laughs> device time. Uh, were there any rec recommendations in your report uh, regarding one-to-one -one devices versus carts, especially for the younger grade? No, we don't off, I mean, that's outside of our scope. Our scope is to evaluate the initiative as BCPS has designed it. And that was designed four or five years ago, correct? Whenever it was designed, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, also, it was it was uh, discussed a little bit by Ms. Causey um, regarding, I mean, for the board, if we're going to evaluate a program, uh, and I know that this was the goals were set up by the previous board members four or five years ago, but when I just sit back and say, how do we evaluate a program and whether it's a good place to put our resource, our limited resources. You want to 
take into account opportunity cost of other system resources. Um, but apparently that was not anything defined in your evaluation. Um, so you did not look at any kind of cost benefit analysis of the STAT program. It would be very difficult to do because of uh, even given what's been raised today. Like how much does equity cost? Like if you remove the compute the devices and low income kids don't have devices, what's the cost of that? Like I don't know. I wouldn't know how to do that. Like the goals of a school district go far beyond student achievement and some of them are very difficult to quantify. On the other hand, if we're only looking at student achievement and then we want to see what other opportunity costs there are that impact student achievement, that's a little bit easier to quantify. If you wanted to narrow to one particular outcome that the school district only wants to achieve, but that's out of my purview. I mean, I have my opinion, right. but that's up to all. All right, it's, it's right. 9.15 or almost 9.15, and we've had a good hour, almost two hour discussion here. Um, uh, we concluded the questions about the report instead of debate about issues that aren't in the report. Are there any other questions? Ms. Mrs. White. So first, I just want to thank Johns Hopkins, doctors, uh, doctors Ross and Morrison. Um, thank you for your report and for your evaluation. Uh, your feedback makes us better. Um, we know that we are not absent of all kinds of you know, flaws and potential issues. The same um, was true during the cooperative learning era. The same was true during co-teaching in the beginning um, of those efforts, yet we know that those things were effective. And so I'm really pleased with the results uh, overall um, of this report, as you said, um, that you have looked at districts all over the nation. And for me to hear this as uh, a superintendent, to hear whether or not it's working and to hear overall that it is, it's, it's um, I think it's encouraging. We know that we have things to work on and for those who are having connectivity issues, we do know and we will be addressing those and getting information out. But again, we're expecting that in the implementation of any initiative that we're going to have a few bumps in the road, but overall we look at the overall effectiveness. It may not be what everyone wants to hear, maybe it doesn't fit into a particular narrative, but we do know that overall we have to uh, look at the, per the performance of the district. And I do think that our teachers' perceptions do matter. And I think that our administrators' perceptions matter as well. And I don't think that they are shy or uh, about telling us the truth. And I do think that they have those opportunities. I've heard here tonight um, where your credibility has been in cr question. However, I do not think that you would put your credibility on the line. And so I just want to thank you for your objective um, external evaluation so that as we're moving forward as a district, uh, we can do so given the objective data that we have before us. So thank you for that. Thank you. Dr. Morrison, thank you very much for a great presentation. The entire board thanks you. And Dr. Ross, you started slow, but you finished with a flourish. <laughs> Mr. Chair, um, regarding my request for an agenda item for the next um, meeting so we could get answers to the um, questions on connectivity, could we um, submit those questions and have those um, sure. answered on the website you know, posted great. and have an agenda item at the next meeting? Great. We'll see. We'll see about the agenda stuff, but we can definitely have questions delivered to the uh, to the administration. The administration can address those. Thank you. Next on our agenda Mr. is Chair. item. Mr. Chair, excuse K. me. Just to dovetail with that, could Miss um, White, could you just email the board the de a deadline that you would like yeah. us to submit we'll, the questions? She'll set up a schedule. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Item K is board member committee updates. Mr. Yulfader, audit. Um, the, the audit uh, committee, uh, I called the meeting off last Tuesday. The, the sole item on the agenda that was passed out <clears throat> was to meet with the uh, auditors doing the financial audit and the CAFRA audit. And I got word from them about 12 o'clock that uh, they would not be prepared uh, to meet. And so I sent out a notice to cancel the meeting at 1248. Uh, for those who didn't look at their emails and uh, showed up at the meeting, I apologize. 
Uh, but it seems that before some meetings, I get emails as late as an hour before the meeting uh, requesting information or other things. So I apologize, but uh, that's what I was told by the auditors. And so I responded to their message. Thank you. Building and contracts, Mr. Stewart. No. <laughs> Curriculum. Mr. McDaniels? Pat or unless Mr. Young wants to go. Mr. Jones. <laughs> It was good. <laughs> the, well, I'll just say the curriculum committee met last on October 18th and discussed athletics partnership with the Community College of Baltimore County and uh, mathematics instruction. And we'll meet again on November 15th at 4.30 here at Greenwood. Great. Um, digital safety, nothing to report? Nothing, but we do have a um, meeting coming up. So I thank uh, Ms. McComas for scheduling that. I don't have the date readily available, but it'll be posted. Right. And policy review. Uh, thank you, Ed. Um, I note that the Policy Review Committee meets in this very room, uh, and so for anyone who may come to next month's board meeting, I mean, rather to who, who may come to either the board meeting or the Policy Review Committee meeting, uh, you may wish to linger in the hallway and admire the uh, summer art enrichment um, uh, results of our students who participated in that program uh, from our six district schools in Oakley Elementary, Parkville Middle School, Pine Grove Middle School and our Lock Raven Academy and others who may not be in the 6th District. Posture Review Committee will meet, very good Chuck, will meet <laughs> on uh, November the 12th at 4.30 in the room. Please make sure you get a chance to check out the kids' art. They did a great job. Thank you. Our, our next meeting is Thursday, November 8th. It's on Thursday and not Tuesday because Tuesday, November 6th is Election Day. So everyone go out and exercise your rights and privileges. We'll see you all on November 8th.